A couple years back, just before Thanksgiving, I decided to finally visit Yellowstone. Been reading about it for years, watching those nature shows, all those geysers and animals. Everyone I spoke to, well, they couldn't stop talking about it. I figured that since the crowds were likely thinning with the colder weather, now was the time. Work had been brutal, and a nice little solo trip with just me and the wilderness sounded perfect. Hell, maybe I'd even treat myself to one of those rustic little cabins just at the edge of the park. I rented a pickup truck from the airport in Billings, a rugged thing meant for Montana roads. I remember laughing to myself and wondering if some big city type like me could actually handle something like that. Turns out, it wasn't hard, and there's something about the roar of a beastly engine that's downright addicting. I got on the highway and pointed the nose of that beautiful piece of machinery toward the park. Made excellent time. Even hit a little diner right along the highway one of those places with sticky checkered tablecloths and pies just like Grandma used to make. My name's Mark, by the way. Nice to meet you. Yellowstone's a sprawling monster of a park. It took me quite a while just to get from the entrance near Gardiner to the cluster of visitor centers around Old Faithful. It didn't matter. Being out there, the wide open roads, those mountains cutting a crisp line against the cold November sky, felt incredible. The first couple of days I played the tourist, walking the geothermal boardwalks with steam coiling in my face, the smell of sulfur burning at my nostrils, snapping selfies like every other idiot. My goal, though, was to see the park without all the other people. Get into the backcountry, find some peace. My fourth day in, that's exactly what I did. Packed up some basic essentials, food, water, warm clothes, the usual backpacking fare, and ventured out on a well-marked trail. I started near one of the geyser basins, figuring the steamy haze and otherworldly atmosphere would make for a memorable start. My plan was to loop around, maybe do some off-trail hiking towards the wilder terrain near the park's border. That's how I always like to do it, find a little corner of the woods that doesn't look like it sees human footprints too often. Now, you gotta understand that as someone who spends most of his life staring at spreadsheets, those first few hours in the woods were pure bliss. I barely touched my phone, even turned it off completely for a while. It was perfect. I took my time, breathed in the clean air, stopped to stare at tracks in the mud, wondered what creature had made them. It felt amazing. Like, truly amazing. The silence, the stillness. It was everything a guy trapped in a cubicle could wish for. There were some other humans on the trail at first, but their voices fell away into the forest's whisper. That's when things started to feel off. Maybe it was just nerves. Spending too much time alone can do that to a person. It's almost like a sixth sense you haven't used in a while begins to wake up. I was on edge, twitching every time a branch snapped behind me. I swore I saw movement a couple of times out of the corner of my eye, but when I glanced back, there was nothing. Still, that uneasy feeling only got stronger. It was the middle of the afternoon by this point, but the shadows cast by those gigantic old-growth trees grew thicker, like they were deliberately hiding something. Every few minutes I'd hear a sound, a sort of crackle in the underbrush, or the rustle of unseen leaves. Every single time, the noise came from a different direction. This wasn't the wind, I was certain of it. My instincts were screaming at me. Something's out there. Something you wouldn't like. I tried to push the paranoia aside, chalk it up to the quiet. Then came the smell. I stopped dead in my tracks. It was faint, a sort of musky scent, like that of a wet animal. But there was something else to it, an undertone of rot, like meat left in the sun for too long. 
Something wasn't right. I reached for my pack, fumbling for the bear spray I'd bought on a whim at the gift shop. Not because I genuinely thought I'd need it, more as a last line of defense. I'm far too practical for the whole, better safe than sorry, mentality. But with those shadows dancing over the path, and the stench thick in the air, I wasn't laughing anymore. Something was out there with me, following me. That feeling solidified with every rustle of unseen leaves. I'm not a religious man, but a prayer might have escaped my lips even so. Now, this part might sound silly to you. Heck, the park rangers told me as much later. That's their job, I suppose. The voice. That was another thing that tipped everything from just being creepy to outright nightmare fuel. It started quietly, a faint muttering behind the trees, just outside my peripheral vision. Not human, that much was for sure. The rhythm was wrong, and there was a raspy hiss at the edges of each word. I wanted to run. My limbs begged me to flee. But that damn curiosity and fear itself had rooted me to the spot. I had to know what was behind the voice. The rational part of me knew whatever it was would likely tear me to pieces, and yet, a strange fascination settled over me. A tree to my left shuddered, its branches rustling, its leaves parting. For a brief moment, my eyes caught sight of something. It's difficult to explain in words, I realize. Think of a patchwork, one put together by a mad person. There were glimpses of a bony frame, covered in taut, mottled gray skin. A flash of a snout, too long to be natural, yellowing fangs jetting out like daggers. Eyes those horrible eyes yellow slits of light burning within their sockets. My stomach lurched. I vomited into the undergrowth. And with that, what little restraint I had left vanished. It turned away, and I turned too, not back toward where I came from, but in the direction that this creature led, and I ran. Ran hard, blindly stumbling over twisted roots. The muttering sound intensified behind me, the voice almost guttural in its rage. Thorns and bramble lashed at my legs, drawing blood. The stench filled my nostrils, thick, putrid, and suffocating. The path wasn't a path anymore. It was just a desperate struggle to put space between myself and whatever that thing in the trees was. I tripped, and the world slammed into my face dirt, leaves, pain. Then I was scrambling again, clawing my way uphill fueled by adrenaline and fear. A cliff ledge jetted suddenly before me, and I skidded to a stop, heart pounding in my chest. It was only as I stared down into the vastness of the ravine below that I realized there was nowhere left to run. My eyes stung with tears. It was over. I turned around, expecting to see the yellow eyes blazing through the trees, ready to end me. Nothing. There was nothing. I stood there, panting, waiting, yet all was silent. I slowly crept back from the edge, my knees buckling with relief. Then I heard it, the crackle of dry leaves from within the trees below the cliff. It slithered past my line of sight, disappearing into the underbrush. It had toyed with me. That realization almost broke me. It took me hours to muster the courage to get out of there. That thing, that damn monster could reappear at any moment. Eventually, the setting sun, and the knowledge that night in the wild with some creature lurking was even worse, helped me find my feet. Back on the trail, I ran without pause, not stopping until the twinkling lights of a roadside and flickered into view. People at the end looked at me like I was crazy. Dirt clung to my torn clothes, blood streaked my face from the fall and thorn scratches. And the story, well, who the hell would believe a story like that? Rangers found my footprints later. They asked about the trail conditions, what the wildlife was like, 
routine stuff. They never caught whatever that thing was. They likely didn't believe me. A few weeks later, a couple went missing along a stretch of that same trail. Never found them. When those poor souls' story made the news, those memories clawed their way back, the stench, the rustling of leaves, those inhuman eyes, a piece of me knew. Some things live out there, hidden in the deepest, darkest corners of wild places. Whatever I encountered then, they call it a skinwalker. A few years have passed. It still gets my heart pounding any time I think about it. Every detail from that trip sticks out in my mind. I'm Jacob, an easygoing guy known for being overly skeptical and always needing a logical reason for any situation. When this all started, I thought the locals were exaggerating. Now I find myself sitting around a flickering campfire, telling this story over again. Just thinking about it sends shivers down my spine. We set out in late fall. Fall is the perfect time to travel because most of the crowds are gone, but the weather is still good enough to get out on the hiking trails and to camp out at night. My buddy, Kynan, and I had spent ages prepping for this trip. We hit all the stores, gathered up supplies, and planned out our route. Bryce Canyon National Park had seemed ideal challenging hikes, gorgeous landscapes, and an overall adventurous, roughing it feel. What's not to love? The very first morning after hiking and exploring for a few hours, we spotted something strange. In the distance, perched on one of the towering spires of rock was a pile of what looked like bones and bleached skin. There was something very unusual about them, though. We hiked as close as we could, but it was high up on one of the sandstone rock formations, out of reach. The sight was both gruesome and fascinating. Morbid curiosity got the better of us, though at the time I had not known its significance. The bones could have been from any wild animal, and the white material might have been a tattered hide of some kind. I'd reason that probably this was some predator's leftover a coyote or another, but there was such a massive quantity of remains, I tried to shake it off as just part of nature. We pitched our tent late that afternoon, tired but exhilarated from a long day of traversing the trail. As the day faded into night, we cooked a quick meal, nothing complicated over the campfire and traded stories before turning in. It felt just like a hundred other times we'd done this in the past. It was peaceful. Or so we thought. It started with a sound, a kind of guttural howl. It sent shivers through me. Even then, I assumed it was some kind of desert animal. In the stillness of the night, that seemed very unlikely. Maybe we had chosen a spot a little too close to a wild wolf. Kynan and I had seen several warning signs at the park entrance regarding wolves and bears, but to both of us, those sightings just seemed remote. We hardly felt it necessary to worry. I had not taken those warning signs too seriously. I'd always felt comfortable when hiking, in tune with nature, aware of my surroundings. I wasn't easily bothered or threatened by these warnings. I should have taken them very seriously. But now, this strange guttural howl was definitely out of the ordinary. It sounded different than anything I'd ever heard before. In that moment, a bolt of panic hit me. Kynan had bolted upright in his sleeping bag, too. Did you hear that? He whispered, voice shaking slightly. He wasn't as composed as he usually acted. I could tell this sound had unsettled him just as much as me. I didn't answer, didn't have to. Then, in the flickering embers of our dwindling fire, I saw it, the first glimpse. From behind the brush at the edge of the circle of light around our campsite, I saw a pair of glowing eyes, yellowed and hungry. 
and large. Those eyes seemed much too big for any normal wild animal. Whatever this was, it was watching us. In seconds, my fight-or-flight instincts kicked in. I threw back my sleeping bag, reaching for my boots. I had an unsettling suspicion I'd be doing more fleeing than fighting tonight. I fumbled through my backpack for my pocket knife. Something was out there, in the dark, watching us. Just the idea of those menacing eyes watching my moves had me panicking. With clammy hands, I finally produced the knife. Now, it wouldn't have been much. I had no other weapons of any kind. I mean I wasn't going to fight off wild animals. With one quick shove I nudged Kynan, rousing him more fully as my eyes stayed fixated on the glowing eyes now shifting slightly further out in the darkness. He looked towards the shadows just as the creature took a tentative step further into the moonlight, and what came next was so chilling. It almost turned my blood to ice. What had just emerged into the open was like nothing I'd seen before. Some unholy mixture of creature and human. The thing walked on two legs, yes. But what terrified me was the sheer size, towering over both of us, and its shape. It wasn't human, even vaguely so. There were no discernible clothes, just long, wiry limbs, bent grotesquely in some places, covered in coarse, bristly hair, a light brown color. Then I saw its face the muzzle protruding, the long, razor-sharp teeth, an unnaturally wide jawline, and of course, those horrible, glowing yellow eyes. It let out a sound somewhere between a deep growl and a choked-off wheeze, an unmistakable warning or perhaps even a death threat. We weren't meant to be on its terrain. This creature was territorial, and hungry. This thing seemed unnatural, demonic, as if risen from the darkest parts of the earth. I felt I was looking at a beast not of my world. Kynan and I had frozen— the fear was too shocking and immobilizing. It slowly circled us, those horrible eyes never leaving us. Its movements were a bizarre mixture of graceful and jerky, as if it was having to force itself into an unaccustomed shape. There was an insidious intelligence behind those eyes, an insidious threat to the creature's presence. The air grew thick with the heavy stench of blood and something, rotten and I knew the thing wouldn't just toy with us. It would kill us. The only thing was we didn't know why it just stood there, stalking us from just past the campfire's reach. Then my memory returned to what I saw earlier that day, those bones strewn atop the rock. All I could do was try to keep that beast contained in the narrow perimeter around the fire's embers. There was just a few flickering coals left, a pathetic little protection against an inhuman foe. The thought kept creeping around in my frantic mind that we could become, like that grisly spectacle from the morning. Panic was setting in and every thought that crossed my mind seemed more ludicrous than the last. Then I finally did what I should have done from the very first moment of this encounter. We scrambled away. We turned on a heel, and ran into the woods as fast as we could, leaving our camping gear, our supplies, absolutely everything behind. This is where the horror gets worse. I didn't look back. It didn't matter if the thing followed. What else could we do? The adrenaline pumped through me as we burst through the brush. I heard Kynan close behind, panting, pushing ahead. I don't even know how long we ran. We didn't dare stop. But my stomach sank to my feet when I looked ahead. There was a clearing beyond this part of the thick wilderness, then a wide asphalt road cutting across. On the other side, our rental car. If we reached it, maybe somehow, we could survive. It was my only hope. And then, it was snatched away. From our left, with unnatural speed, it appeared again, this horrible beast. Not from behind. 
We hadn't outrun it. Its movement was so terrifyingly silent that it moved faster than we did. Or, maybe it always knew and this was simply some grotesque torment. A toying game. It enjoyed tormenting its prey as if it wanted to extend the thrill of the kill. Or maybe that had always been its plan. Cut us off. Drive us. Hunt us. I have no answer. There is no logic to a creature like this. My blood went cold. My hopes seemed to vanish in that horrifying, frozen second. Kynan, in front of me, froze too. And in those next couple of beats, that monster lunged. It leaped towards Kynan, and in that sickening blur of motion, he vanished. He couldn't even cry out for help. There was just nothing. At that moment, something snapped in me. Rage consumed every corner of my being. That creature had what I witnessed then I can't speak aloud yet. I've spent a lot of time, therapy, trying to cope with those moments, with all of this. My brain can't seem to. It is so difficult for me to bring forth my memories of this ordeal. That was Kynan, my best friend. All my instincts told me to turn, to try and avenge him. Instead, I ran. Blind terror pushed me towards the car. I can't explain it. There may be no explanation. I have nothing to show for bravery or friendship. It wasn't my choice. In that moment, I lost all logic and rational thought. But there I was, racing across that road, fumbling desperately for my keys as the headlights swept toward me, a car approaching in the distance. Maybe there was still a way out. By the time the vehicle lurched to a stop in front of me, I'd realized. There was blood on my hands. On my face even. Kynan's blood. There is no escaping its stench, and I still feel it even after many showers to try to forget his final seconds in this world. The driver had jumped out in alarm, yelling frantic questions. What? Are you okay? Is someone after you? All I could do was choke out two words. Just two. The only possible explanation for what, for who had been after me in those woods. That inhumanly fast creature with razor-sharp teeth and bloodthirsty, glowing eyes. It wouldn't have let me go. Not until after a brutal kill. Skinwalker, I sputtered. In that moment, every bit of my skeptical nature seemed to crumble away. Skinwalker. Those words echoed in my head, along with the image burned forever into my brain. In the distance, even above the rumble of the approaching car, I heard that unnatural screeching again, that horrifying howl. The thing hadn't vanished. I doubt it ever would. It would hunt in these territories, and likely more people had suffered, and likely more still would. I was only one more survivor. A haunted one for certain. I stumbled around to the passenger side and collapsed into the front seat. As the car tore down the road, taking me back towards civilization, back towards some semblance of safety, I kept turning to stare back into the dense, black woodland. That thing was still out there, somewhere unseen. I'd seen its power, its cruelty, and my powerlessness against it. The news crews swarmed like flies in the weeks that followed. Kynan was missing, declared dead. I told the police every excruciating detail, though at some point, those details began to shift and bend until they started to seem more dreamlike. There was no trace of any creature like the one I had described. None. I tried desperately to cling to reality, to remember every inch of those monstrous features, and that unnatural, terrifying movement as it hunted us. Even to myself, the story grew blurry, less plausible. The authorities began to look at me, the lone survivor with no evidence, not even a trace of my destroyed campsite. 
Was I just suffering from PTSD and delusional episodes triggered by Kynan's sudden and horrific disappearance? Had I panicked from some natural phenomena in the dark of the canyon, and just created an impossible enemy for my mind to try and understand? Perhaps. Years pass, but that awful night at the campsite still looms over me. I see those yellow eyes in the reflection of a passing headlights. I hear that guttural shriek in the wind. Kynan is still gone, missing. That much they couldn't erase from my story. It's something I'll carry with me forever. They said there was no history of any animal attacks in that location, no predators at all large enough to carry off a person without a trace. It made them doubt my story with increasing intensity each day. They never did quite pin Kynan's disappearance on me. Not enough evidence, not enough motive. There were only some vague references to my being emotionally unstable in those final reports. And so I lived, but with a weight greater than I thought a person could bear. It's in those rare moments, when I stare out at the wilderness around me, at the vast expanse of forests and dark places, that my skeptical mind wavers again. Something deep down reminds me evil lingers in those wild, unexplored corners. The locals had known all along that something haunted those lands. It's that knowledge, that sliver of the impossible made real, that keeps me terrified and forever trapped. For now, I haven't returned to Bryce Canyon. The memory is, I try not to go near places with heavy woodlands. That was its lair, a place it stalked and took a piece of me at such a cruel cost. But what if it wasn't bound to Bryce Canyon? What if the legend had some gruesome truth to it? What if that skinwalker continues to prowl, unseen, unstoppable, just like it did so many years ago? preying on anyone unfortunate enough to cross its path. A few years back, can't say precisely when, I found myself down in the southern stretches of New Mexico. I needed a break. Big city life wore me down. I'm an accountant and you wouldn't believe the kind of stress tax season creates. I wanted nature, a change of scenery, that old cliché. New Mexico delivered. I rented an SUV, stocked it with what I might need, and headed out exploring the sprawling arid terrain. At first, I stuck to the tourist spots, you know, Carlsbad Caverns, White Sands. That didn't last long. Boredom sets in quick for me, makes me restless. I craved something wilder, a true sense of isolation. A local gas station attendant suggested Chaco Culture National Historical Park. Not exactly off the beaten path, but remote enough to suit my desires. I hit the road, that SUV kicking up clouds of red dirt. Chaco Canyon is something else, let me tell you. Ruins of dwellings from way back in the day, the 12th century something or other, built by what were once called the Anasazi people. You're surrounded by those towering sandstone cliffs, an almost eerie feel to the place. No crowds, no cell signal, just me and the ghosts of an ancient civilization. First two days I wandered. Hiked among the ruins, marveled at the ingenuity displayed there took some snaps with my phone, figured I'd show my work buddies back home what real isolation looked like. That third evening changed everything. Sun sets fast in deserts. One minute fiery orange in the sky, the next replaced by deep twilight. Shadows play tricks on your eyes there. Maybe that's the explanation for what I saw. It started as a movement on the cliff edge, a silhouette so distant I thought it was some large bird, an eagle or something. Then it moved again not how a bird flies, but something, slinking down the slope towards me. 
Now, folks out there in New Mexico warn you about mountain lions. That first panic surge of adrenaline I had. Pure animal instinct. But a mountain lion doesn't hunch and lurch like this thing did. I got a glimpse, a flash of something pale, hairless, and vaguely human-shaped, and that's when I bolted. Back to the SUV, keys fumbling in my panic-stricken hands. The thing in the twilight never rushed towards me, never broke out into a sprint. It was slow, calculating. Almost like it was, toying with me. By the time I'd fired up the engine, slammed it into gear, and spun wheels in the loose sand, the creature was far closer. Now there were no more tricks from the fading light. I saw it clear. Tall, too tall for a human. Gangly arms ended in long, clawed fingers that dragged along the desert floor. And the face, I haven't slept right since. It was stretched and bony, with eyes sunk in black pools, an open, tooth-filled maw that hung down to its chest, and a smell like rotting meat carried on the dry wind. It moved faster then, not a sprint, but those legs ate up the distance with unnatural strides. I rammed the car into reverse, threw it back into drive. There was a thump as something smashed into the rear door, then a chilling screech like claws scraping metal. Dirt sprayed and headlights danced as I tore out of there. I saw it for just a brief, terrifying moment in the rearview leaping in pursuit. It ran on all fours, the way an animal might, that unnatural shape tearing through the dust. But those eyes, always on me. You might think I was hallucinating, out there in the middle of nowhere. Maybe heat stroke mixed with exhaustion but something pounded on the SUV's side, close enough that I could see long, pale fingers scraping with impossible strength at the windows. Then there were noises in the roof, something heavy. And that awful, rotten smell again, overpowering the car's AC. Don't know how I made it out of there alive. Drove through the night, some blind instinct fueling me. Found a cheap motel at dawn, Slept for two days straight. Woke up to frantic news updates from across the state. Missing hikers, reports of livestock maulings, descriptions that all seemed too familiar. One particularly horrifying detail stuck with me. On a reservation out by Chaco, an elder was muttering something over and over, talking about an evil spirit, something the people had feared long ago. He called it a skinwalker. You don't talk about stuff like that, not at an accountant's job in a busy office. They'd think you're cracked. I still get flashbacks. I still sleep with a loaded gun on my nightstand. Part of me wants to go back out there someday, face it, fight it, but even writing this is enough to put me on edge. They say these creatures stalk their prey, can mimic voices, lure you to your death, that they wear the skins of victims and transform. No one believes me back home. I doubt you do either. All I can say is, be careful if you ever find yourself alone out in those wild places. Because I don't think I was hallucinating. I got a glimpse of something old and evil, something that's probably stalked that land since long before the stone cities of Chaco were ever built. Something with a pale, hairless body, an emaciated face, and a bone-deep hunger. Something that now knows my name. It's been a couple of years now, but I still check the rearview mirror too often. Can't seem to shake that uneasy feeling that something might be waiting just outside the frame of my vision. That's what happens, I suppose, when you stare into the eyes of pure damn evil and live to tell the tale. My name's Kay Maddox. Used to be a mechanic before, well, before everything. Now, I just drift between odd jobs, never staying in one place too long. 
I can fix anything with an engine, work construction, whatever all that matters is the money and putting one more state between me and that damn desert. See, a while back, me and my buddy Silas decided to hit the road up through California and Nevada. Road trips were kind of our thing. Cheap motels, bad gas station hot dogs, listening to tunes you love so much that by the end you swear you'll never want to hear them again. It's the best kind of life there is for a grease monkey with no family to tie him down. One detour led to another, like they always do on those kinds of trips. Before we knew it, we were cruising a highway through Death Valley National Park. I had been before. It's got this stark, alien beauty you gotta see to believe. Silas, not so much, and was gaping out the window at the craggy mountain ridges rising above the salt flats. That's when we spotted the signs Zabriskie Point. Silas gave a shout, and I swerved the truck right over. Gotta hit up the touristy hotspots now and then, right? I parked down in the designated lot and we grabbed our phones for those cheesy photos you send back home. You know the view, those bad lands of crinkled golden hills stretching to the horizon. There was barely a soul around, the mid-afternoon sun too blistering for most folks. For once, I was grateful for the emptiness. Feeling a bit restless, I wandered off from Silas as he fussed about fixing his hair for a selfie. That was the first mistake. Don't get me wrong, the lookout point has railings and signs and stuff. There's not much reason you'd plummet to your death, unless you decide to get an even better look, that is. Beyond the edge of the paved parking lot, there was this rocky trail leading down into the canyon. Maybe fifteen steps down a slope, and boom, suddenly your view opens up onto a whole other panorama seemed worth it to me. That first part of the slope wasn't steep at all, and figuring I could always scramble back up later, I followed. Second mistake. Maybe halfway down, things got steeper. Loose rocks tumbled away under my boots, and I had to grab a scrubby bush to steady myself. That's when I saw it, half hidden in the shadow of a rocky outcrop, a small cave opening. No tourist would likely even notice the thing, hidden away down there. But curiosity gets the better of me sometimes. Figured I'd just take a quick peek at what might be inside. What I found changed my life forever. At first, the darkness and dry, stale air in the cave felt like a relief from the blazing sun. Took my eyes a minute to adjust. Then I made out the pile in the corner. Now, being stranded out in the desert isn't that uncommon. Folks overestimate their vehicles, take wrong turns, get heat stroke, all kinds of reasons you might end up needing rescue. Except when I crouched down next to that pile, it wasn't a heap of abandoned clothing. I realized they were bones. Sun bleached, scattered, and not all animal looking neither. Some of them seemed far too long the wrong shape, human. I was on my feet with a surge of adrenaline and nausea so fast I'm surprised I didn't hurl all over the rough floor of the cave. That's when I heard it. Not a loud noise, a sort of rustling whisper at the opening of the cave. Something big blocked the sunlight for a chilling moment. I saw it. That's the only way I can think to say it. I saw that tall, Lanky form in the fading light, not quite standing upright, a hunched posture like it was straining against its own height. I saw that skin stretched bone tight over its gaunt frame, and those empty, bottomless eyes gleaming out at me. Worse, something was in its jaws dripping a red trail and swinging with grotesque motions I swear it was half a human leg. A strangled whimper tore out of my throat— then pure survival instinct kicked in. I bolted. Back up that treacherous slope, the creature behind me with a speed that defied all sense. Each one of those long, clawed hands slapping against the stone, 
It sounded like gunshots at close range. It felt like something was tearing at my back with each stride. I'm no Olympic athlete, never have been. But fear can work miracles. Somehow I stumbled, crawled, and slid my way to the top. Silas looked over in alarm, just a second before the creature burst from the trail behind me. He screamed, ran. I don't know what it did to him. I didn't look back. Car keys shaking in my hands, I got the truck sputtering to life and tore out of the lot. That night, and most nights that followed, were a blur. Abandoned that truck along the side of the highway and never looked back. Didn't stop until I crossed the Arizona border and collapsed in a sleazy motel, news reports about disappearances at Death Valley echoing on the crappy TV. That's when I learned about the missing hiker they haven't found yet. They talk about mountain lions, crazed recklesses out in the wilds. Me, I knew what I saw. There are stories from way back. Folks on the reservations whispering about shapeshifters, things that aren't fully human that walk the desert in search of victims. They call them skinwalkers. Some part of me, maybe the part that's just clinging to sanity, tells me I must have imagined it. But then I remember that putrid stench coming off it, and the bloody feast inside its cave of horrors. That was real. The nightmares of those soulless eyes are as real as can be. And the worst part, the thing you folks will never believe, the thing I still swear I can sometimes hear on a lonely stretch of highway at night, it's the rhythmic tapping on the back window of my car. Like claws against glass. It happened a few summers back, when I was young and dumb enough to think myself invincible. Worked as a wilderness guide out in Wyoming, near the Tetons. You should see those mountains, the way they just rise straight out of the plains into the sky like they're scraping something raw. My favorite was backpacking. Taking clients with too much money and not enough sense out into the backcountry for a week or so. Show them there's still some places where it's just you and a sleeping bag against the world. It's good, honest work, even if some folks pay big bucks just to complain about the mosquitoes. This particular trip, my group was small. Just me and one older couple, the Whitakers. I'll never forget their faces, that mix of snooty entitlement and the slightest nervous flicker as they took in the trailhead. No cell service. No latrines, nothing but thick forests rising on all sides. They both signed the emergency waivers I handed them, Mr. Whitaker with a grumble and his wife with a tiny whimper. I started down the packed dirt trail, figuring I'd have to keep those two on a tight leash. That was my first mistake. I don't know if it was the wide-eyed look on their faces, or just that urge every guide learns to dread. Something told me this wouldn't be a by-the-book hike. Sure enough, by day two, Mr. Whitaker was already talking about heading back, about how their luxury lodge supposedly had way better views, anyway. Now you have to be firm with that sort of client. The permits get filed weeks in advance, and those remote campsites aren't easy to come by. But part of the job is also keeping things at least somewhat pleasant. Maybe they wouldn't enjoy esmores around the campfire, fine by me, but getting myself stranded with them all week deep in the backcountry wasn't high on my to-do list either. We'd set up camp in a valley near a stream. Seemed like a smart call to me, even with all the down timber crisscrossing the clearing. Figured we could get enough of an open view over the treetops so at least I could find my bearings easily. It never even occurred to me to wonder what might have caused all those snapped branches. See, folks in Wyoming know about bears. Even city slickers have had the sense hammered into them enough to pack their food properly, hang it right out on a branch at night. The problem was, 
I wasn't thinking about bears. My mind was fully focused on how Mrs. Whitaker was getting awfully handsy with one of those collapsible wine bottles she'd stashed in her backpack. That's why I missed the smell at first. It hit me as Mr. Whitaker stormed off toward the woods to relieve himself. That sickly sweet must that hangs in the air after a carcass has been rotting a few days. Before I could so much as shout a warning, it was there. Right on the edge of the clearing, rising from behind the tangle of logs. It was taller than any elk I'd ever seen, and the antlers, wrong. The wrong shape, too spindly and branching. Something wasn't right about the head either. Too thin, too stretched out, and those eyes, the way they were sunken in, gleaming just a bit too yellow in the fading light. It took me a chilling moment to realize it wasn't an elk at all. Not anything natural, that's for damn sure. It was on four legs, hunched and straining like it was about to pounce. And its coat, patchy, almost mangy, was some parts bare and revealing skin stretched too tight against bone. My blood ran cold. Every bit of survival instinct was screaming at me to run. I glanced over at the Whitakers, saw their jaws drop open in confusion. Not terror, not yet. Still figuring I was overreacting to some scrawny coyote they couldn't quite make out. A roar ripped out of the creature's throat. Deep, guttural, nothing an elk could ever make. Its body lurched forward, and that was enough. I took off running into the undergrowth shoving Mrs. Whitaker as hard as I could in the other direction as she started to shout in panic. Mr. Whitaker just gaped in dumbfounded horror. Those next few hours are a blur, a mix of panic sprints through the dark and scrambling over jagged rocks. Each crash of foliage behind me made sweat pour down my back. There was this terrible clicking sound, its claws hitting the stones behind me, maybe— that would start up with horrifying bursts of speed followed by moments of dead silence. And then, screams. They weren't like any human sound I'd ever heard. There was the Whitaker's voices, choked off with terror, and then a series of wet, ripping squelches I tried to drown out with the pounding of my own heart. There was the roar of the creature again, but now there was a triumphant note to it. After that, all was silent. I don't know when I passed out. Just woke up hours later, the rising sun a brutal mockery in the blue sky above the trees. Something cold and slick touched my leg, a trickle of blood that had run down the rough bark of the pine I must have slumped against. I stumbled upright with a grunt, not even caring where I was headed. Just away. Anything that was away from that godforsaken clearing. Search and rescue found me a day later. Ravings about creatures and attacks didn't get me very far. They patted me on the shoulder, talked about hallucinations and dehydration, about how the wilderness can play tricks on the mind. All nice and polite, as they put me on that gurney. Then came the news that broke me for good. No sign of the Whitakers. Vanished with hardly a trace. Wyoming's got wild places, spots where there's nothing but nature for miles on end. They keep those maps taped up in ranger stations to warn folks. Places where if something happens, well, there's nothing to be done. But they sure as hell don't put all the warnings on those maps. Especially those old stories told on reservations out the back of nowhere. My mind still flashes back to those sunken, gleaming eyes that chase me in the night. To the legends whispering about skinwalkers, those monstrous things that shed their humanity and take to the wilds in search of prey. I quit my job at the end of that season. Took the long drive south, never once looked back at those mountains in the distance. Every now and then, if I let myself drift off on a lonely highway— Listening to the tires hum under the endless sky, I still swear I hear a clicking sound on the wind.
A few years back. I hate thinking about it now. I worked in construction with my Uncle Rick. Not glamorous, I know, but it fed the family. Rick's an old school guy, tough as nails, never complains. I always looked up to him, kind of felt like we were a team. He taught me the things my own dad never bothered with. Back then, we took a lot of jobs out of state, long hauls and cheap motels. This particular season, we were stuck with a contract way out in the back end of Wyoming. Town called Ten Sleep. You ever been that far west? Desolation takes on a whole new meaning. Miles of empty highway, scrub brush, and cattle bones left to bleach in the sun. Even with a few podcasts going, the drive itself was its own type of misery. We got in around eight at night, bone-tired and desperate for some grub. This tiny, worn-down diner was the only place lit up on Main Street. Inside, about three regulars sat hunched over their plates, staring into the middle distance. The food was passable, greasy and overcooked, but we were more starved than picky. Two weeks until we can see civilization again, kid, Rick grumbled, wiping his mouth on a faded napkin. His eyes drifted past me, settling on something by the window. I turned, saw an older rancher type staring right at us. His grizzled face held this unreadable look, either friendly nor angry, but with an intensity that prickled down my neck. His eyes met mine, then narrowed into slits. Without a word, he stood up and stalked out of the place. Guess a couple of city boys stick out around here. I joked, trying to sound light. Rick didn't laugh. He just nodded solemnly towards the exit. Maybe he didn't take kindly to our faces. Get an early night, son. Long day of labor coming up. Dawn's light washed out the tiny motel room, bringing no sense of relief. As I got dressed, I felt like I was being watched. I'd blame it on the old cowboy dude, but it felt heavier than that. An unexplainable unease in the pit of my stomach. My name's Mark, by the way. Mark Jensen. That job site took us up some winding dirt track, way outside of town. I remember how strange it all seemed even then, not a house or person for miles. It was supposed to be a cattle ranch, but I'd seen more fences than cows the whole drive out. We were set to dig foundations for some outbuildings, but that sense of being wrong got worse the further up that ridge we went. By midday, this fogged over feeling settled in my head. Like I'd gotten a dose of bad medicine, limbs leaden. Rick had started to slow down too, wiping the sweat off his face every few minutes. That's when I first saw it, a blur of dark shapes, low to the ground, scuttling on the ridge beyond the trees. My stomach twisted, but my brain couldn't keep up. There were too many, and they moved too fast. Rick, you seeing that? I managed to get out. He turned, shielding his eyes. Hell, maybe the heat's getting to us. Let's pack up, come back tomorrow. We didn't speak much on the drive back. Part of me felt crazy, convinced I was hallucinating, while the other part shivered with primal dread. Something wasn't right on that mountain. Something unnatural. Back at the motel that night, we bolted the door like a couple of teenagers in a horror movie. Rick was quieter than usual, a deep line etched between his brows. He switched on the tiny TV, the signal fizzing out every few seconds, but neither of us paid attention. Sleep didn't come. Every little sound, the AC rattling, footsteps down the hall, had me leaping out of bed. My heart hammered against my ribs, a constant pounding of unease. Around two in the morning, my eyes shot open at the sound of a crash echoing down the hall. It wasn't just a noise, though. It was animalistic, a throaty guttural growl that froze the blood in my veins. 
Then came the scratching. God, that scratching sound at the door. I could hear Rick scrambling on the floor, fumbling for something. My own hand shook so bad I couldn't grasp a thought, could only huddle on the edge of the bed, paralyzed with fear. He'd managed to snag the shotgun out from under the mattress. There was a blinding flash, a blast so deafening I think I peed myself a little, followed by a wet thud against the other side of the door. That hideous inhuman growling changed to a yelp, then whimpered away. We stayed up the rest of the night, backs pressed to the wall, that gun trembling in Rick's hands. Just before dawn, I peeked out the window. It was all so clear. I swear the motel lights had turned the ground blood red. A half-eaten carcass slumped near the parking lot, its fur shredded, its body, twisted. I can't quite make myself describe it, the angles wrong, the limbs bent and torn. That old rancher from the diner had never mentioned this kind of predator. Let's get the hell out of here. I croaked to Rick. We piled into the truck and tore out of that town, never looking back. To this day, we don't speak much about it. Most folks take us for fools when we try. Tell us it was coyotes, mountain lions, the harsh landscape playing tricks on us. But deep down, within that heavy lump of terror still churning in my gut, I know that ain't true. Those beady eyes that fixed on me at the diner, those impossible shapes shifting in the brush, that scratching at the door, the mangled mess I saw that morning, there's something in those Wyoming hills. Something old, something hungry. They say sometimes, out there on the loneliest highways, you feel the gaze of the skinwalker. If that's the case, well, then it had my scent. And maybe someday... It'll come back for seconds. It's been a while now, a few years at least. That first year was rough, full of nightmares and waking up covered in a cold sweat. You think back on your life, those moments that divide who you were from who you became. For me... It all started with a camping trip up in the Olympic National Forest. Yeah, I'm an outdoors a kind of guy. Chris Dawson, by the way. Love those deep woods, that cathedral silence far from the hum of the city. Took my old man out for a bonding trip when I was maybe 14 years old. He wasn't the touchy-feely type, but I thought maybe some quality time might do us good. We didn't go into the deep sections of the park, nothing that hardcore. Just some trails off the main road, plenty of other folks about. That first night felt pretty standard, set up camp, ate freeze-dried food while Dad made his snarky comments about roughing it. Slept all right, although even back then I thought I heard noises out there in the darkness. Not animals, though, something heavier— like rustling brush and heavy footfalls just on the edge of where the firelight hit. Next morning, we went our separate ways. Dad liked to fish, and I'd always found hiking more exhilarating. He told me to meet back at the campsite near sundown and pointed vaguely at some distant hills. Shouldn't have gone alone, even knowing the path was well used. Still, it's that dumb teenage sense of invincibility that gets you into trouble. Those hills felt wrong. Not scary exactly, just off. An old-growth forest is kinda like an alien world to begin with. Moss draped over every surface, light barely managing to break through the leafy canopy. There's life, but it's teeming under your feet, not in view. The silence wasn't a peaceful kind. It was like the place was just sitting there, waiting. Hours crept by with nothing to mark them but the change in the slant of the light. It felt like there should have been birds or something, just some sign that other creatures existed in this dim green tunnel. The thought made my breath quicken a bit, something unsettling churning in my gut. 
I turned in a slow circle, searching for any hint of the trail. That's when I saw the figure standing off to my right. He was partly obscured by a massive tree trunk, so my brain tried to fill in the missing pieces. Tall, with long limbs draped in ragged fur. Antlers sprouted from his head, and those eyes. God, those eyes burned with a sharp yellow gleam in that almost human face. My legs went numb. That wasn't supposed to be real. Some park ranger dressed up? A hallucination? Even as that rational part of me screamed, the deeper, animal part knew. There was pure hunger in that stare, and I was the prey. I screamed, the sound thin and shrill. The figure lunged, and my body finally jerked into motion. I stumbled back, tripping over fallen roots, gasping for air. I had enough sense to just run, not look where I was going. Branches smacked my face, the damp earth slick beneath my feet. Every so often, I heard a crackle from the undergrowth, the sound of pursuit. That guttural breathing fueled my panic, a surge of desperate energy. Eventually, I burst from the trees and fell hard, nearly tumbling right down a ravine. When I clambered back from the edge, I looked behind me. Nothing but dense green shadows. Dad was waiting at camp, fire casting flickering shadows on the tent canvas. The look he gave me when I staggered, panting, into the light was full of hard questions. I rambled some bullshit story about losing the trail, not quite meeting his eye. We both pretended to believe it. After that, things changed between us. No more outdoor adventures, a distance we never breached. That glimpse of something wild and terrible left a mark on me that's never quite healed. My nights were full of those yellow eyes boring into me, that low, hungry growl vibrating through my own chest. Sometimes I imagine I can still smell the damp scent of leaves and musk, and that deep, unnatural fear courses through me like an icy river. The internet didn't exist back then, at least not like it does now. No easy research to tell me what I'd seen. It took years until I stumbled on some forums where lost souls and hunters shared their whispers, cryptic references to things lurking in the woods, the tall shadows that moved just out of sight. They called it a skinwalker. Whether that's truly what it was or not, I can't say for sure. What I do know is that some places you shouldn't tread alone. Maybe those forgotten corners of nature always belong to something else, something we ain't meant to look upon. I never return to that part of the woods. Some instincts are worth paying attention to, no matter how strange. My advice? Stick to the crowded paths, and don't go wandering off when the light grows dim. You might end up regretting it more than I ever did. A few years back, I took a road trip down through New Mexico. Single guy, open road, always been kinda restless. You get that itch? Like you need to just drive for a bit, soak up the scenery before heading back to your normal routine? My name's Elliot, by the way. Anyway, there's this stretch of highway just south of Las Cruces that cuts through the high desert. Beautiful country. Wide skies, flat land, those distant mesas rising up like ancient statues. It felt a little off, maybe too isolated, but that was part of the appeal. I got to feeling adventurous and took a dirt road exit marked for some park I'd never heard of. Turns out it was called Soledad Canyon. Figured I'd do a bit of hiking, clear my head. Right at the park entrance... An old pickup was parked askew, one tire almost in the ditch. No one in sight. The sign had seen better days, sun-bleached paint, the lettering peeling off. It wasn't much, just some basic warnings about flash floods and rattlesnakes, 
standard stuff. I shrugged, grabbed my water bottle, and headed up the rocky trail. First hour or so felt peaceful. Birdsong filled the air, and the sun wasn't yet fierce. But something gnawed at my gut. Maybe it was how there wasn't anyone else around. Not a single sign of human life. Then I saw the bones. First just a single rib, bleached white on the sun-baked earth. Some kind of animal, coyote maybe? I kept walking. Then there were more, vertebrae, a cracked skull half buried in the dirt. No fur or sign or struggle. Just a scattering of silent remains. The trail led deeper into the canyon, narrowed further up, walls of red rock climbing on either side. It felt like the place was slowly swallowing me up. That's when the smell hit me, a sharp iron tang like stale blood. I gagged, hand clamping over my mouth. There, wedged into a cleft in the rock, something lay rotting. My eyes took a few beats to adjust. It was an animal carcass, mangled and twisted somehow. I couldn't make out the species, couldn't look directly at it for too long. Those hollow eyes seemed to be following me, even in death. I was halfway to sprinting by the time I caught sight of it again. This time it was alive and staring down at me from a high outcrop of stone. My blood ran cold. The silhouette stood on two spindly legs but moved oddly, its back half too high like a broken dog. The head twitched, snapping toward me almost like a bird. No fur, just grayish, hairless skin stretched so thin you could see its bones pressing through. I couldn't even blink. It was so monstrous. My legs twitch, but I was frozen. Fear had its claws embedded in my chest. It gave a hiss, this raspy sound that didn't seem fit for such a creature. Then, without warning, it launched itself down the slope. Movement blurred. Time blurred. Just the desperate lunge of those claws flashing out with impossible reach. I screamed, throwing myself sideways. I felt the sting on my arm, a burning sensation like I'd ripped my skin on razor wire. Panic kicked in. Pure animal instinct to survive. I scrambled backward, clawing at the loose rock that crumbled as I sought purchase. There wasn't time to check the damage. Not with those rasping growls getting closer. All I knew was I had to get higher ground, put some distance between myself and that damn thing. Somehow I didn't fall as I climbed. It probably looked ridiculous clawing and gasping and half-sobbing in my terror. A burst of energy carried me to the summit. The thing had vanished back into the shadowy crevices beneath me. I waited for hours, crouched down behind a boulder shaking. When the sun finally began to dip behind the canyon walls, I made my move. Stumbling through the deepening twilight, I followed the same treacherous path every crackle of dirt sounding like a pursuing footstep. When I finally made it back to the abandoned truck, there was blood seeping through my hiking shirt. But the sight of that familiar world had never been so welcome. Back on the highway, with the lights of some tiny town on the horizon, it'd be easy to write this off as a messed-up encounter with a mountain lion or something. My arms scarred from the laceration's deep gouges, proof that something attacked me out there. I went to a clinic, had them cleaned up, told them a dog scratched me. Never said a word about the thing I actually saw. They probably would have thought I lost it. I did some online digging in the safe blandness of my apartment. There were hushed whispers, old folk tales about the creatures the Navajo called skinwalkers. Monstrous shapeshifters, twisted and unnatural. My guts twist again just thinking about it. I'm no believer in those old superstitions, but I can't deny what my own eyes saw that day. That was not a natural creature. It wasn't just the physical impossibilities, but the deep, 
seeping wrongness it carried in its presence. These days, if I get the driving itch, I keep to the interstate and make sure to never stop before nightfall. There are parts of this country that hide some things we ain't meant to glimpse. The Soledad Canyon isn't on any map you'll find, and if you ever see that turn off down near Las Cruces, my advice is simple. Keep those wheels turning, and don't look back. It all started a couple of summers back, right before my cousin's wedding. That's the kind of thing family drags you into, even if you live way out in the sticks like I do. Truth is, being so far out is why I like it here. No neighbors, no traffic, just endless acres of rolling Montana wilderness. I work a ranch hand job, nothing glamorous, but reliable. Pays the bills. My place, well, let's say it has more character than comfort. Anyway, this wedding nonsense meant getting back into civilization, way down south near Yellowstone Park. That whole area always gives me a weird vibe. Too many tourists, too much development in one of the last truly wild places left. My cousin, Jory, insisted on some pre-wedding outdoor adventure thing. Glamping, she called it. Figured it was the least I could do, so I packed my camping gear with a bad attitude and drove on down. First night, Jory and her posse of bubbly bridesmaids got thoroughly spooked by some animal rustling around the campsite. Raccoons, I figured, or maybe a skunk looking for scraps. They wouldn't shut up about it, and it grated on my nerves. I told them to get a grip and after a bonfire and a bit too much boxed wine, the night quieted down. Next morning, I woke with the sun and set out on a little exploratory hike. My name's Towerin, by the way. Seemed kind of fitting to leave the ladies to their squealing and pre-wedding drama while I did my own thing. It was a glorious morning, crisp mountain air, pine needles still wet with dew. Trail wound through tall evergreens into a little canyon cut by a creek. That's when the feeling hit me, a prickling at the back of my neck, an awareness that stretched beyond sight and sound. Something watching me. At first, I thought it was my imagination. I stopped, scanned the trees, saw nothing but branches waving in the breeze. But when I walked, that unnerving prickle followed. That's when I saw it. A huge, muddy print near the water's edge, too misshapen and big to be any animal I knew. I felt a jolt of unease. Was it a joke? Did Jory set something up to scare me? But that print looked genuine, and I wasn't known for being the easily pranked type. My heart started a quick drumbeat against my ribs. There was something else on the other side of the creek, further back in the shadows. It was hunched over, picking at something on the ground with long, bony fingers. For a moment, I caught a flash of movement as a head turned in my direction. It was humanoid, almost, but horribly wrong. Its eyes glowed a chilling yellow. That's when it let loose a screeching howl that made my hair stand on end. And then it moved. With sickening, unnatural speed, it bounded towards me disappearing into the trees in a flash. Terror pumped through me like icy water, and I turned, running blindly across the creek and back up the canyon. Thorns tore at my clothes and branches slapped my face, but I didn't stop. Every rustle of leaves behind me fueled my sprint. Back at the campsite, panting and disheveled, I tried to piece together what in the hell I'd just experienced. Jory stared at me like I was crazy, chalked it up to pre-wedding stress. As soon as we packed up that afternoon, I was out of there, the wedding abandoned. On the long drive home, I kept checking my rearview mirror, every dark shape in the shadows sending chills down my spine. That night, 
I double secured every entry point in my ramshackle house and left all the lights on. Sleep didn't come easy. In the following days, dread sank deep into my bones. Each creak of the house, each howl of the wind, became charged with menace. At work, I'd jump at every rustling tree branch, half expecting that thing to lunge out. I tried to convince myself it was a fluke encounter, but deep down, a dark corner of me knew what I'd seen. That twisted figure haunted my mind, its glowing eyes slicing through even my most restless sleep. One evening, sitting in my darkened living room, a news report caught my attention. There had been a string of unexplained deaths up near Yellowstone, tourists going missing, some bodies found mangled. Something the investigators hadn't even been able to identify was said to be on the loose. It was then that I remembered Jory saying there were old Native American legends in the park about creatures, shapeshifters they called, skinwalkers. A cold wave washed over me. Now, I don't go out unless I have to, and those trips never happen at night. If I get stuck out after sundown, I stay in my truck, gun close and fear even closer. Every whisper of wind feels like a stalking predator, every creak of wood a clawed footfall approaching. It grinds you down, living like this, living in this fear. Maybe they were right about me, maybe I just crack easily. The worst part? Even if I told the whole damn story, who would believe me? It happened a few summers back, down near the Louisiana Bayou. I'd gone to visit my old college buddy, Rance, who'd taken over his grandparents' shrimping business. I needed a break from city life, and the idea of spending time on the water, helping with the hall, it seemed like a pretty sweet escape. I'm Zeth, by the way. The first couple of days were exactly what I expected, hard work under an unrelenting sun, and in the evenings, piles of fresh seafood and beer cold enough to sweat in this humidity. We swapped stories, laughed until our sides ached nothing too out of the ordinary. Even though the locals talked about strange things sometimes, it seemed harmless. Swamp legends, you know? The place where we docked the boat each night was on a stretch of the bayou that snaked inland, away from the open gulf water. This particular night, we had to work later than usual because of a problem with the net. By the time we wrapped up, it was well into the hours of darkness. No big deal, usually. We worked under floodlights and had made that trip countless times with nothing but the moon and stars above us. As we motored along, the swamp noises shifted, the frog croaked slower, insects buzzing in odd, discordant rhythm. Something about it gave me chills. Rance was at the helm, his profile grim and tight-lipped as he focused on navigating the waterway. Then I saw it a hulking figure on the banks. Tall, thin, with tangled-looking hair matted down into what looked like dreadlocks. At first, I thought it was some local eccentric out wandering at night. Hey, Rance, I said, keeping my voice calm. See that person over there? He shot a glance in the direction I pointed, and let out an ugly curse. Then he whipped the boat around, gunning the engine like his life depended on it. Hang on, he yelled, the sudden panic in his eyes giving me my first real taste of fear. I did as I was told, bracing myself against the gunwales as we roared across the water. My mind raced as I looked back towards the place we'd seen the figure. I expected it to run, but it did the opposite. With a terrifying screech, the thing leapt towards the water and began splashing after us. I swear its fingers scraped at the back of the boat. There was something unearthly about it, not just the speed, but something wrong with how it moved, all jerky and unnatural. 
Moonlight caught in its eyes and they shone yellow, like an animal, and far too close together. Fear ripped through me like fire. Keep going! Don't stop for anything! Rance screamed. His voice was barely recognizable as panic took hold. As if on cue, we hit something in the water. The boat lurched so hard I went stumbling backwards, cracking my head on a metal bracket. Darkness slammed into me for a moment. I struggled upright, disoriented and tasting blood in my mouth. Rance had the engine going again, pushing the boat as hard as it would go. Looking back, I saw that whatever we'd hit was swarming the boat, clawing at the wood with long, filthy nails. My stomach heaved and a cry rose in my throat, but Rance cut me off. Seth, get inside and put on a life vest, he shouted over the roar of the engine. That's when I saw him reach toward his tackle box, his hand fumbling inside for something. Before I could protest, he shoved a shotgun into my trembling hands. If I go down, keep firing at those things, and just hope it's enough. As I squeezed past him, I turned toward the dark shape swirling around the boat. I caught a glimpse of a gaunt face with bared, oversized teeth that glinted under the moon. And I knew these weren't people. It was like everything we thought we knew about this bayou was torn apart, and what filled the void was this pure, unnatural terror. I ducked inside the small cabin my heart pounding like a sledgehammer in my chest. As soon as I'd latched the door, I heard a scream echoing across the water. It was Rance, followed by a hideous splashing and thrashing. I jammed the light vest on, knowing damn well that what waited in that blackness could tear through thin plastic in seconds. Then I braced myself, shotgun ready, eyes darting between the windows and the flimsy locked door. Time lost all meaning out there. Nothing existed but the sounds of the things attacking what was left of our boat, and my desperate gasps in that cramped space. I fired the shotgun into the night, aiming for the shapes clawing at the wood just inches away from me. Every shot felt like it should shatter the small confines of the cabin, but all I could hear was my own blood rushing in my ears. I thought they'd finally get through, dragged me out into the black water to whatever horrific fate Rance met. And then, slowly, the sounds outside grew less. Finally, they stopped altogether. But I didn't dare move. I stayed curled up in that cabin until the pale light of dawn began to break over the swamp. That's when I took the chance and ventured out onto the deck. The boat was barely intact, and Rance was gone. All that remained was a dark smear on the deck, his tackle box half sunk in the murky water. By some miracle, the engine started, just barely, sputtered but got me back to the dock. There I tried to make myself understood, mumbling through a broken jaw and cracked ribs. It didn't go well. Some of the other shrimpers thought I was drunk, others talked about swamp fever, causing hallucinations. No one believed me about rants, about those things in the water. The authorities dragged the spot where I said the attack happened, found nothing. No body, not even remnants of our mangled boat. I guess in that relentless heat, and with all the predators in the swamp, traces vanished pretty quickly. Even with all that, my words became a sort of local legend— they still tell the story of the city boy who lost his mind out on the bayou. Every day since, I look at the swamp bordering my land, remembering Rance's scream cut short, seeing that yellow-eyed glare beneath the moon, and that gnawing doubt flickers in the back of my mind. Maybe they weren't wrong. Maybe those things do exist, hidden within the murky water, preying on the unsuspecting. Some legends grow from truth, they say, maybe things really do lurk out there, just below the surface. Maybe those whispers I hear just at the edge of sleep aren't fever dreams, but warnings. I guess I'll never know for sure. 
For all I know, it might be a skinwalker. It happened a few summers ago when I went hiking along the Appalachian Trail. It's one of those things you have on some life goal list to conquer that hike someday, right? Most folks do it in chunks, but I had some vacation time saved up and decent gear, so I decided to try a longer stretch on my own. Bad idea. But hey, we live and learn, well, if we're fortunate. My name's Soren. Now, I used to work as a firefighter in the city, which kept me in reasonable shape, and I loved those woods. You wouldn't catch me calling myself a hardcore backpacker or anything, but I knew my stuff, did my prep, had backup plans in place. So yeah, a solo long-distance hike seemed like a healthy challenge. Besides, that trail is famous for being friendly, lots of hikers sharing the route, shelters every few miles. How bad could it get? The initial few days were great. There was the usual mix of folks out there, through hikers, weekenders, families out for a stroll. Trail chatter was easy. There's a sort of unspoken solidarity with people facing the same sweat and rain. Some older dude gave me pointers about blisters. A teenage couple warned me about a recent bear sighting, the standard trail chat. It was peaceful and enjoyable. By the fifth day, things took on a different vibe. I noticed that I'd barely crossed paths with anyone that morning. I'd figured most hikers probably took shorter itineraries. It always was that way. Still, it started to gnaw at me a little as I kept going, hour after hour, only hearing the forest, my boots hitting the dirt. My usual trail soundtrack was missing. At about midday, my path cut through a section in Maine, remote, heavily wooded, a steep uphill climb. That's when I began to hear something above the crunch of fallen leaves. It sounded like another hiker, someone with a heavy pack, breathing hard as they tried to catch up. The thing is, this breathing sounded odd, a rasping quality I couldn't place. Now I've run into enough out-of-shape wannabe outdoor heroes during my time. Figured they'd bitten off more than they could chew and were taking a much-needed breather. Trail etiquette in such a scenario means slowing your pace if you notice, giving whoever's behind you a chance to catch up. So that's what I did. For a minute, the only sound was the forest. No footsteps, nothing. The rasping breath sounded again but different this time, off to the side of the path, coming from deeper in the trees. Then I froze. This wasn't human breathing at all. I don't know about all this supernatural stuff, but growing up as an EMT's kid gives you a weird perspective on sound. Panic, pain, it's got its own symphony, and this ain't it. What came through those leaves sounded big, animalistic, almost wheezing with exertion and it made me cold. Like the kind of cold that has zero to do with mountain air. A guttural grunt broke the silence. No, not quite a grunt, more like a choking sound, as if whatever was breathing struggled to force air through something. Something clogged, constricted. Whatever common sense and curiosity I possessed took a holiday, right then, because instead of hightailing it down that path, I stepped through the brush toward the origin of the noise. I still can't reason why I did that. Some dumb firefighter left over bravado, I guess. The rasping noise got worse, almost painful to hear. Then, through a tangle of underbrush, I caught a glimpse of movement. For a fraction of a second, my brain struggled to compute what I was seeing. Part of me thought it was some kind of deer— injured, caught in vines. But something about the shape, the angles, was wrong. The way it strained against the brush, its form was tall, hunched. And for a horrifying instant, what seemed like eyes met mine. Yellow, pupilless. 
not animal eyes. That's when the thing began to heave its way toward me, crashing through the foliage with a terrifying strength. Then I saw it properly, too thin, limbs too long, the skin pulled so tight over its bones that it shone white in patches. Mouth gaping too wide, teeth broken and protruding at odd angles. Panic finally found its way through my frozen muscles, and I turned and ran. Every creak of a branch, every rustle sounded like it's ragged, rasping breathing chasing me down the trail. And it was fast. God, it was fast. My pack slowed me down. There was a shelter not too far ahead, an old stone structure. That was the plan. Maybe safety in numbers, or at least sturdy walls, but I wasn't going to make it in time. With a burst of adrenaline that burned in my lungs, I ditched the pack and pushed on, stumbling over tree roots in blind terror. My chest was on fire, but somewhere within me, training kicked in. Instead of a straight run, I zigzagged, hoping to throw whatever pursued me off track. It worked for a little while. The choking noises faded until just as I was starting to think that maybe I had actually lost it, the forest in front of me exploded with movement. It burst onto the trail, blocking my path, maybe fifteen feet ahead. That same pale stretched skin, tangled mess of hair, and those glowing yellow eyes fixed on me. A long, thin arm raised and with a speed that would put any baseball pitcher to shame, it launched a chunk of rock directly at me. The blow caught me square in the temple and everything went black. I regained consciousness under a sky turning pale gray with dawn. My head pounded, blood soaked my shirt, and that rasping breath was right there. The thing circled me, sniffing the air, its gaze lingering on the blood soaking my temple. It squatted in a way that reminded me uncomfortably of a frog watching a fly. Then, after a few seconds, it simply stood and melted back into the woods. It took every ounce of will I had not to collapse on the spot. I dragged myself toward the shelter, half-blind and bleeding, repeating prayers and promises I never bothered to believe in before. Luckily, I wasn't entirely alone. By nightfall a few new through hikers had turned up and helped get me cleaned up. No one was too surprised at my state given the bears in the area. No one asked too many questions, just nodded when I mumbled something about falling off the ridge. I still live in Maine, far from that damn trail. Folks around town seem to talk about strange sightings with alarming frequency, stuff they brush off as trick of the light. I don't judge. Now I carry a gun on my hikes. Never seen anything matching that creature again, but out there, the forest seems thicker these days, shadows feel denser. Maybe those who survive this thing, and it seems some must have, we become marked somehow. Maybe all we've done is make ourselves visible to things out there. It feels a bit like that thing I ran from isn't something out of some old scary story. Maybe it's a skinwalker. It happened last fall. An odd thing to say, isn't it? As if time melts away when some terrible switch has been flipped in the universe. My name's Killian Yates. And before all this, life was decent enough. Working hard, trying to stay afloat, paying off student loans. You know how it is, that modern-day grind. I used to escape into nature as much as I could manage. There's a place I visit, an old ranger station out in the middle of nowhere up in Montana, tucked away near Glacier National Park. Miles of rugged forest. Mountains reaching up like ancient gods. Just me and the wilderness. This trip was meant to be the same. Find solitude, a chance to recharge. What a load of crap that turned out to be. Day one was fine. 
clear skies, a perfect temperature for a good hike. I got an early start, figuring I'd cover some serious ground. There's an old ranger's journal at the station, and it talked about a fire tower further in the woods, said the views were spectacular. Well, I'll say. Spectacular views require effort, especially with all those uphill switchbacks. Late afternoon, I pushed through the final stand of trees and there it was. The tower itself was nothing fancy, just rusted metal jutting up into the sky. But my God, that vista. Mountain faces that looked painted, sunlight glinting off distant snow caps, rivers twisting through the valleys like strands of discarded thread. Breathtaking doesn't quite cut it. So yeah, feeling high on life, despite being out of breath and sore as hell. My only regret? Forgetting to grab my pack and water as I scrambled up the tower. Not the smartest move. I took my time on the way down, trying to absorb the scene. And that's when the uneasiness started. Not an obvious shift, no chilling breeze or anything like that. More like the volume of the world had been turned down several notches. Birds sung quieter, insects fading away. Even my own footsteps through the dry leaves seemed muffled. My body picked up on it before my brain did. Hair prickling on the back of my neck, the gut instinct that there's something you're missing. By that point, the sun was dipping lower, its shadows reaching like claws through the trees. That's when I saw it, or rather I heard it. It came from deeper in the woods, not so much a snap as a crackle. Something shifting its weight against the undergrowth. That's when the fear struck. Icy and sudden. You don't spend time in the wilds without realizing, sooner or later, that you are most definitely not alone. Mountain lions, bears, the occasional rabid raccoon, these were dangers I could prepare for, deal with rationally. But this, it struck a primal chord, a deep wrongness at the edge of reason. Curiosity and an adrenaline rush battled with panic. I didn't even have a choice at that point. Whatever, it, was, it wasn't leaving me alone. Another branch snapped nearby, and there was the undeniable noise of something moving toward me. Slowly, deliberately. Circling. That's when I noticed the smell. Earthy yet rancid, thick and almost cloying. There was no point hiding. I spun trying to identify the source. What I saw made no damn sense then, and sure as hell makes no sense now. Emerging from the trees, maybe forty feet away, was a figure. Pale, like it had rarely seen sunlight. But not thin, not emaciated as I first assumed. More stretched. Too tall, with unnatural lanky limbs. I thought about running then, but my feet remained rooted, my mouth open as if the words might finally explain what I was staring at. Then it moved. And God, was it horrifying. It flowed, but with impossible angles and jolts, and in the fading daylight my eyes struggled to keep up. When it turned fully in my direction, my mind recoiled from what it saw. There was a face of sorts. Eyes too dark a lipless mouth twisted into a disturbing grin. And when it let out a hiss, I finally ran. There was no plan, no real logic at that point. My legs thrashed desperately through leaves and over stones, each sharp branch slap another lash of fresh terror. The thing stalked me, the sound of its erratic movements almost keeping pace. For how long, I couldn't say. Time had ceased to have meaning. My chest was on fire. Every gasping breath felt like knives. Yet, somehow, amidst the blind adrenaline, a thought crept in. I shouldn't hear it anymore. No matter how weird or fast it was, I should have lost it. Or it should have caught me. My steps began to falter, and it became evident I had made it back to the old clearing near the station. 
relief was replaced by shock. In the center of that clearing, I knew exactly what I would find. They told me later it was a hiker, or what remained of one, at least. My description sounded outlandish to the cops, of course. They put it down to a cougar, or something. What do you even say when logic fails, especially after that trauma? And there it is, the aftermath. You can imagine the nightmares, the hypervigilance that keeps me clinging to populated areas. My little escape turned into my personal hell. Every so often, if I dare look online, I find a snippet of something similar. Disappearances. Sightings. Some even mention old lore from Native American tribes about creatures born from dark rituals. Something whispers that, out there, the name Skinwalker isn't just a myth. I can't be sure of what I saw back there, but I know, in my bones I know, I'm not crazy. There are corners of the world best left undiscovered. That fire tower in those endless woods? That once breathtaking view? They have all been twisted into something monstrous in my memories. Now, my only peace is found amongst the crowds, surrounded by the comforting din of everyday life. There's a terrible secret out there in the world, a lurking wrongness hidden amongst the trees. Maybe one day, the courage to find answers will take hold. Or maybe this is how it has to be. A couple years back, before all this, everything happened, life felt simpler. I was living paycheck to paycheck, struggling to make it like so many others. You know how it is, long hours, bills piling up. Not great, but not exactly unusual. It all started when I decided to go on a solo hunting trip to clear my head. My name's Elvin Archer, and the outdoors... That's always been my sanctuary. Being surrounded by nothing but the sound of the wind and the trees. Something primeval about it. I knew a spot nestled within the vast forests of New Mexico, the Cibola National Forest. A sprawling expanse of wilderness. Dense, rugged, the land rising sharply into the sun-baked mountains. This time, something was different. Even at base camp, I felt uneasy. I told myself it was nothing, just my mind playing tricks, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. Each crunch of dry leaves beneath my boots seemed too loud, too noticeable, like they echoed. It started to eat at me. Night fell, and with it, the temperature dropped like a stone. That's New Mexico for you. Sweltering days and freezing nights. I tried to get some sleep, but it was no use. My mind raced, every rustle amplified by the darkness. The second morning, I decided to hike out further. See if some exploration would settle my nerves. There was something calming about being on the move, even with that lingering sense of dread. I moved steadily my weathered boots sinking into the earth with each step. The trees around me thickened, creating a tunnel of shadow that blocked out the afternoon sun. It was peaceful, in a way. But still, that prickle of unease lingered. Like an itch I couldn't scratch. Hours bled into one another as I navigated the terrain. Each hill promised to finally open up and give me a good vantage point but they all offered little reward. Discontent started to creep in, with myself more than anything. All of this time wasted, and just to confirm those fears were likely for nothing. I felt stupid. It was a wild goose chase built on intuition alone. I thought about turning back, figuring it was best to cut my losses and try again the next day. That's when I saw it, or rather, heard it, at first, just a quiet snap, the dry crackle of a twig against something heavy. 
and then silence. An eerie, sudden absence of everything. Even the birds, not a single chirp. No rustling in the leaves. Now here's the thing. I've spent time in forests my whole life. I know it sounds a bit cheesy, but you really become attuned to the land. So when the entire world goes silent like that, well, it raises enough alarms to wake the dead. My eyes were drawn to where the sound had come from, maybe thirty, forty feet away. Through the thick vegetation, I glimpsed nothing. I strained my eyes, desperate to identify whatever it was that had vanished like smoke. That's when I noticed the smell. Sweet, but with a sickening edge. Like meat left out in the sun for far too long. That smell, something shifted in my mind. My instincts took over before my logical brain had a chance to protest. I grabbed my rifle, heart hammering in my chest, every pulse like a gunshot in my ears. The rifle offered some sort of comfort. Even just holding something solid, tangible. With agonizing slowness, I started taking small steps towards where I first heard the sound. It felt like every atom in my body was begging me to run the other way, but fear and curiosity wrestled inside me, and neither was willing to let go. What I found, I was not prepared for that. I know how insane it sounds, and for the longest time, I wasn't even sure if I actually saw it, or if my brain concocted that horror as some defense mechanism to cope with the aftermath. Let me explain. There was a clearing up ahead. In the very center was a mutilated elk carcass. Or what was left of an elk. Something had torn through it like paper, organs sprawled across the ground. It was gruesome, but not necessarily unexpected. Mountain lions could do that kind of damage. The smell, now overpowering, made sense. Decaying flesh and whatever predator claimed this kill. It was the movement behind the carcass that threw me. At first, a glimpse of pale flesh shifting against the dark backdrop of the woods. And then, it stepped out into view. My rifle was up in an instant, a reflexive jolt as the creature lumbered into the sun. At first, I thought I was looking at a person. Distorted, but vaguely human-shaped. Too thin, the limbs oddly stretched and bent. Pale, hairless skin that almost glowed in the light. My mind was short-circuiting. It couldn't fully process what I was seeing. The way it moved, erratic, fluid, but all wrong. Then it turned its head, and that's when I saw the face. I wish I hadn't. Those eyes, not animal, not human, there was something coldly intelligent within them. That sickening thing grinned too wide for its jaw, its lips stretched with teeth that were far too long, too sharp. Then, just as quickly as it emerged, it was gone. It moved faster than seemed possible, disappearing back into the trees with an uncanny quiet. I stood there, rifle dangling by my side, sweat chilling on my skin. Common sense and self-preservation finally managed to wrestle control as the shock started to subside. I took off running, back the way I came. I kept imagining the feeling of those elongated fingers on my skin, those horrifying teeth ripping into my flesh. At this point, it dawned on me that if this thing truly wanted me, there was nothing I could do to stop it. Maybe my panic spurred it on. Or maybe it simply wasn't hungry at the moment. The thought gave little comfort. In my rush, I tripped, twisting my ankle in a painful snap. But the jolt did some good, pushed me back to reality. Now there was something concrete to deal with. The pain made me clear-headed for a moment. My injured ankle wasn't doing me any favors, so I started a limping jog. Each painful footfall brought me closer to camp. Each agonizing step further from that thing. Finally, exhausted and in excruciating pain, 
I saw the flickering glow of my campfire. The familiar smell of burning wood and stale coffee had never been so comforting. It took weeks for my ankle to heal, but honestly, that felt like the smallest of all my issues. The nights were the worst. Those eyes seemed burned into the back of my eyelids, haunting every attempt to find rest. A few times I thought I saw a flicker of movement out of the corner of my eye, a flash of too pale skin against the moonlit blackness of my living room. But when I focused, nothing was ever there. Maybe it was all in my head, some sick hallucination triggered by the trauma. But something tells me, it was anything but. Life didn't exactly go back to normal. Those few moments in the woods were a tipping point. My perspective, it shifted. Every walk in the park, every late-night drive, a sliver of my mind stayed rooted back there in New Mexico, alert for any telltale signs. You might think that makes me sound crazy, paranoid. Maybe I am. Or maybe this world, our world, is less mundane, less safe than we've been led to believe. It wasn't until much later that I even considered researching anything that resembled what I saw that day. It took a lot of digging through Native American folklore to stumble upon descriptions of ancient, dangerous creatures. There are different names, and specifics change throughout cultures, but one word kept appearing again and again, skinwalker. They're more than just stories, of that I'm now certain. That day in the forest, everything changed. And those few haunting memories, let's just say, it might be worth checking behind you some nights. It's possible your friendly neighborhood isn't so friendly after all. It happened a couple years back, during a cross-country road trip. Always been that restless type, yearning for open highways and distant skylines. I guess you could say that's a big part of why I never settled down. Relationships seemed complicated, and steady work even more so. My name's Torin Flynn, and for about ten years, my old van was home. I worked random gigs in different towns— got by for the most part. Late August rolled around, and all that sticky East Coast heat finally drove me westward. My sights were set on California, some vague idea about crashing on a beach with the other starry-eyed dreamers. But life ain't an Instagram montage, is it? Somewhere within the vast open stretches of Wyoming, that old engine just quit on me. I managed to limp the van into a tiny town, one gas station, two blinking stoplights, and rows of weathered homes that gave the impression folks kept to themselves. The mechanic took one look under the hood and told me point-blank, she was done for. It's funny how a mechanical diagnosis can suddenly upend your entire life. Now, if I wanted to stay a spell— a woman at the local diner mentioned some spare rooms above the old feed store. Not that staying there held much appeal. Still, that day when I hauled my meager belongings up those narrow stairs, a part of me wanted to believe, well, believe that maybe just staying put for a while wasn't such a bad thing. You know how those thoughts go, right? Like you're trying to convince yourself of something even though your gut tells you the exact opposite. Within a week, I fell victim to that dusty town's peculiar form of inertia. Days bleeding into nights, the only excitement coming from the creamed corn specials at the diner, and the ever-present feeling like everyone held their breath when I walked by. There's an isolation to that, to be in a place, yet constantly feel like an outsider. It starts to eat at you. I think this is how it began this unraveling of normalcy. I'd spend long evenings sitting out on the weathered porch, the sky so damn wide up there it almost felt like it could smother you. One night, I noticed movement just at the edge of the darkness. Two eyes reflecting the dim porch light, 
yellow and almost cat-like in shape. At first I assumed it was the local wildlife, but something, something didn't quite sit right. It was those eyes, the way they watched me with what felt like intelligence. There was no real threat in that first encounter, not in the physical sense. The creature, whatever it was, vanished soon enough. Yet, even after I locked the door that night, an unease crawled under my skin, and my restless sleep was plagued with half-remembered dreams of being hunted. You might think I should have left then, cut my losses. But pride is a stubbornly human quality, isn't it? No way was I giving up so easily. The next day, I started asking questions, discreet ones, trying to gauge if anyone else had similar sightings. I figured someone had to know about whatever animal lived out on the town's fringes. Nothing concrete ever turned up. A sheep rancher claimed there'd been coyote issues nearby, and the old drunk at the bar talked about something, unholy, lurking out in the shadows. The only thing for certain was that my nights filled with increasing trepidation. Sometimes, when I dared to open the blinds, I saw those eyes fixated on my window. Logic told me this was a wild animal, maybe even a mangy dog. But it didn't make sense. Animals usually avoid people, unless, unless they're hungry. My breaking point came one humid night as I tried to read before finally giving in to exhaustion. It started subtle, a twig snapping near the woods behind the building, then scratching on the roof, and, as my pulse thrummed in my ears, I caught a faint, wet sound against my grimy window. No doubt about it, something was trying to get in. That's when I grabbed my old hunting rifle and threw open the window. Whatever I expected, this wasn't it. Standing upright on thin, stretched-looking legs was a figure that sent a bolt of primordial terror through me. It was like nothing I had ever seen before. Pale, almost translucent skin pulled too tight over an emaciated body. The mouth hung agape, too wide, in what could only have been a twisted version of a grin. But the eyes... God... It was the eyes that held me in place. Pitch black, reflecting back like twin voids without even a shred of animal instinct within them. The moment stretched, my gun raised, aimed. Yet, just like those first nights, it turned and bolted into the dense shadows. Its movements were erratic, but purposeful. And I knew in that instant that it was toying with me. That thing didn't fear me, not one bit. In the aftermath, there was no proof. No rip siding, no shattered window. I found nothing but the rifle resting on the floorboards, still loaded. When the authorities showed up, the only evidence of the night's horror was the panic in my eyes and the tremor in my voice. It took every ounce of willpower to finally leave that town behind. Each creak of my new car, each flicker of shadow through the windshield felt like a taunt. Even years later, a sliver of my mind wonders if it's ever really over. Because deep down, in the moments when sleep won't come, I sometimes see them again, two glowing eyes watching from the edge of the forest, from the alleyway at the end of the street, from wherever my mind fears lurks in the darkness. I never sought out those whispers online, that speak of similar nightmares. Native American tribes telling of an ancient evil, those that shed their human skin and walk the night cloaked in the forms of predators. Skinwalkers, they call them. Is that what followed me through that town, what might still be following me here and now? Who knows? Some mysteries are probably better left unsolved. The only guarantee is this. Those eyes in the darkness are burned into my mind, and those chilling encounters have painted a permanent shade of gray onto my already restless life.
This all happened a few summers back, just after I took an early retirement package. Had always been good with my hands, construction type, the honest work that wears on an aging body. My name's Rhett Lawson, and after thirty years on various job sites, the idea of nothing on the agenda filled me with a mix of excitement and, frankly, worry. Kids are grown, live out far west, and with no prospects tying me down locally, well, the road always held a certain appeal. Not in a fancy RV like you see those silver-haired couples driving, more like my trusty old truck and a pop-up camper. Freedom on a shoestring budget, or so I told myself. I ended up in this little spot out in Arizona. Desert landscape, stark dry, but that sky stretched forever. There was one of those historic parks nestled among those rugged red rock formations, the type with scenic roads and the occasional interpretive sign marking past settlements. Camp wasn't crowded, mostly folks who kept to themselves. I even saw a couple coyotes skulking at dawn one morning, ears alert, and I figured being so close to nature was probably my closest bet to having an adventure during this whole endeavor. Funny how that word can take on multiple meanings, huh? Looking back, the first hint of things going sideways happened near twilight one evening. There's something eerie about how desert heat just evaporates, replaced by a stillness and air so crisp you hear every little sound. I'd built a small fire and settled against a pile of smooth worn rocks, a beer close at hand. In the fading light, something moved on the distant ridge. My initial thought was a deer. They were common in these parts, but not with that loping gait. My pulse quickened as I strained my eyes, and the figure dropped lower, its limbs unnaturally thin and overly long. For a heart-stopping moment, I couldn't grasp what my instincts were already screaming. Not an animal, it was bipedal, but moved with inhuman jerks, as if its frame wasn't quite put together right. And those eyes huge, unblinking, seeming to glow. Just as abruptly it vanished, swallowed by the encroaching darkness. Fear prickled along my neck, my heart thumping hard against my ribs. Rationality warred with terror. Yet my mind searched for familiar shapes and explanations, clinging to the possibility I must have misidentified the figure. Still, something had lurked at the edge of reason, leaving an imprint of pure disquiet in its wake. As a kid, I heard campfire tales, but even with a belly full of beer, nothing I could conjure even began to resemble the reality of what I saw. It felt wrong to stay out there, so exposed. After kicking dirt on the embers, I stumbled the short way back to camp. No sleep that night, every snapping twig outside my flimsy camper shell sounding like the approach of claws. That's where my pride kicks in. The next morning, a part of me was determined to chalk it up to bad shadows and an overactive imagination. Decided to take a hike, get the blood pumping, get back to normalcy. I headed down one of the trails marked on the park map, winding between towering boulders and scraggly juniper. Despite the morning sun, that night clung to me, and every rustle of leaves set my heart pounding. I must have gone further than intended, and somehow lost the trail markers. It felt like ages before I finally broke free of the maze of rock and saw my truck through the scrub growth. Relief flooded through me, but as I got closer, I stopped short. There, clawed into the dusty metal hood, were strange marks. Too deep to be natural— and spaced erratically like misshapen hands might have made them. I circled the truck, seeing further etchings. Then, in the mud by the creek running alongside the camp, I nearly stepped on it, a mangled deer carcass, torn in a violent display of overkill. And on a flat stone, almost an offering, I noticed the coyote carcass from earlier. Its head twisted backward at an impossible angle, now, 
no logical part of me believed that my campfire sighting was to blame. Fear gave way to something colder, more determined. My gun was locked in a case back in the truck, and after fumbling with shaking hands to load it, I began to search. No more tracks or sign of that thing. No clear indication of where it might have disappeared to. It wasn't until much later that I found myself stumbling across websites devoted to strange phenomena, to legends and reports of things lurking out in the darkness. There was a section on Native American beliefs, whispers of entities known as skinwalkers, shapeshifters of immense power who shed their true skin and walk in twisted forms. Those descriptions echoed back at me, long, unnatural limbs, animal-like, but all wrong. It felt absurd, even as it offered some bizarre form of justification, a framework for something beyond my control. Maybe those old stories I scoffed at as a kid had more truth than I ever considered possible. I never went back to that park, of course. Every so often, the urge to hit the open road resurfaces, but that desert stretch haunts my dreams. Each shadow holds a potential terror, and there's a weight deep down that the old truck will never quite outrun. When darkness arrives, particularly out where there's nothing but wide open space and stars above, something within me knows there are corners of this world the light doesn't quite reach. Maybe it's fear that keeps me grounded now, or some newfound sliver of wisdom. No matter the reason, it's made me cautious, wary of places too wild, and too steeped in a silent history most choose to ignore. This happened a few years back while I was working as a field technician. You know the type. Long hours out in the middle of nowhere, fixing communications equipment for ranches, weather stations, anything off the grid. It's work I enjoy, even with the solitude, though those miles rack up on the truck. My name's Kale, by the way. This assignment took me far up into northern Oregon some logging land just spitting distance from the Washington border. Dense forest up that way, roads more like rough tracks cutting through the old-growth pines. Client had mentioned it being a new lease, some sensor array to help his people keep track of wildfire risks. My job was relatively simple. Test the relay station, get everything ready for their gear. That meant an entire day driving, and most of another spent scrambling around trying to find the damn thing among all those trees. Finally located the relay on a high slope, just as daylight began to dim. The spot had seen a recent burn, blackened stumps sticking up where pines had once stood. I figured I could finish things quickly enough at least make a dent in the drive back before finding some remote roadside motel for the night. My first sign that things were off came with the faint sound of crying. Human, like maybe a kid. Seemed out of place up there, but there could be squatters or lost hikers. No way should kids be out there after dark, though. The crying led me through some brush, deeper into the burned area. It was growing darker by the minute, so finding the source would have been next to impossible without being practically on top of it. There, crumpled down beside a fire-charred pine stump, was a girl. Probably twelve years old, clothes stained and torn, tears still running down dirt-streaked cheeks. I called out, trying not to frighten her. She jumped, a startled sob escaping from her before she looked up at me. I remember what struck me most, the fear in her eyes. Like something more than just being lost and alone out there. My mind flashed through different possibilities. Runaways, family out camping gone wrong. I'll admit I never once felt that I was in personal danger, just wanted to help her. Even in the dim light, the scrapes and bruising on her exposed skin seemed unnatural. 
like something had dragged her through those rough trees and branches. She spoke, her voice raspy and faint, like she'd screamed until nothing was left but a whisper. The gist of it was that they'd separated. Some big fight. He went for my dad. I recall her saying, her voice hitching with dread. I had her describe this he. Tall, skinny, she'd said. Sounded almost human, from her explanation. There was no cell service that far out. Nothing to be done but start getting her out of there. The girl clung to me, practically trembling as we moved back the way I came. Each snap of undergrowth made her jump. Even then, in the dwindling twilight, my brain clung to logical justifications. Maybe abuse at home, some junkie out in the woods, who knows. Still, my skin crawled whenever my flashlight scanned those black trees beyond the path. We barely made it to the base of the incline where the truck was parked when I heard it. A screech, high-pitched like nothing I've heard before or since, and the unmistakable sound of something crashing through the brush below us. Panic surged through me, and we broke into a stumbling run toward the truck. There was more screaming, that same awful screech coming closer. Then, in the dim spill of my headlights, I caught a glimpse of movement. Pale skin stretched tight, figure seeming both too tall and too hunched over. Its limbs moved with impossible jerkiness, its mouth gaping wide as it hissed with an inhuman voice. It took three leaps to cover ground I would have needed four times as many. There was no thought, just frantic action. I shoved the girl behind me, fumbled for the keys and started throwing gear out of the truck bed. Then I remembered about the bear spray. Kept it just in case, and in that horrifying moment, I couldn't think of a less deserving target. When that thing burst from the darkness, I barely contained a shout of terror. I unleashed the spray directly into its face. Maybe animals feel those chemicals the same as humans do. It reeled back, screeched once more, and stumbled further into the trees. Then, just as suddenly as it had appeared, it vanished. For a moment, the only sound was the frantic pumping of my own heart and the girl's sobs behind me. I turned and helped her into the truck, hauled everything back on board, then tore out of there at speed I wouldn't usually recommend on those logging roads. Got her to a highway patrol depot about an hour later. The cops didn't quite know what to do with her, or my story for that matter. They gave me a statement form, then a very serious stare and the usual talk about being alert for wildlife after dark. Maybe they assumed I was some out-of-towner just gullible enough to believe he'd seen Bigfoot. Don't actually believe in creatures like that, but there are strange things that science hasn't explained. When I looked online later, it was almost an afterthought to search for any local missing persons cases. That's where things got even stranger. There was news about a father and son lost somewhere further north in Washington. Found their truck abandoned, no sign of foul play, and not a trace of either in days of intensive search and rescue. They disappeared right at the start of my assignment in Oregon. No connection to the girl, though. Or maybe she got separated at that same time. It all felt like pieces of a horrific puzzle. I started searching out old legends, the type my grandparents would tell around a campfire. That led me to stories from tribes on both sides of the Cascades whispered tales of skinwalkers. Ancient evil, wearing human guise and preying on those unfortunate enough to encounter them. It chilled me to the core that some small part of my brain wondered if perhaps that's what chased us on that mountainside. Never had to go back there, luckily. I quit the field work not long after— finding a technician job closer to the city now. And yeah, it was just coincidence that someone went missing right around the same time. Bad things happen outside city limits, 
even with no lurking horrors from tribal legends. Still, those nightmares come back now and again. The unnatural shape tearing through the darkness, the terrified face of the girl. Part of me wishes I'd never gone anywhere near that burnout stretch of forest. Sometimes, especially when the trees rustle out my window at night, part of me wonders if whatever stalked us will follow the scent again. Maybe those old stories have a grain of truth, maybe, just maybe, there's darkness out there we're not meant to understand. It reminds me to stay sharp, stay humble, and that some paths are meant to stay untrodden. A few years back, I got this wild itch, like an unfinished line of code in my brain. You ever get that? I'm Tristan, software guy, cubicle jockey, a far cry from the intrepid outdoorsman type. But lately, after too many 12-hour shifts and empty takeout boxes, this craving kicked in for open skies and some raw, untamed nature. Death Valley National Park was my destination. Not the most welcoming name, but I'd seen photos. They spoke of stark, alien beauty, like being transported to another planet. It felt right for this primal urge brewing inside. Packing felt odd. I'd hardly camped since I was a kid. Gear catalogs filled me with this sense of playing pretend and a little thrill to match the growing trepidation. I took some old secondary roads, trying to prolong the feeling of escape. I passed weathered ranches and lonely gas stations, a sense of time standing still in these places. I even took a photo of a rusty tractor swallowed halfway by desert sands, my attempt to be artsy for once. Finally, I turned off onto a narrow, some bleached road that wound into the park's interior. Late afternoon painted the landscape in surreal hues. Rock formations jutted at odd angles, casting long, strange shadows. The park looked both magnificent and menacing. My nerves started buzzing, but hey, that was part of the adventure, right? I spotted a pullout with a fire pit and decided fate had given me my campsite. As I unloaded the car, that same nervous buzz flared stronger. The place felt exposed on all sides, the emptiness vast and unsettling. This far from civilization, there'd be no cell service to calm the creeping unease. I half-joked to myself that all I needed now was a banjo playing off in the distance to complete the horror movie setup. I got busy with a clumsy attempt at making camp, mostly to keep my hands occupied. As the sun dipped, plunging the canyon into shadow, and a chill set in, a new thought dawned. This had been stupid. Out here I was nothing, one breath away from disappearing without anyone even noticing. I decided to cut and run while it was still light. Better a bruised ego than whatever lurking in that creeping darkness. But even as I packed my stuff back into the car, this stubborn part of me refused to retreat. What about that raw, elemental experience I craved? I was acting like a scared five-year-old when there was likely nothing more dangerous than a coyote out there. Deflated, I compromised, build a fire and make myself as comfortable as I could, but sleep in the car. Hours dragged by in a flicker of firelight. When a faint sound snagged my attention, my first thought was it was wind in the rocks. Then it rose again not whistling, but a hollow moan rising and fading in a way that gave me goosebumps. It wasn't a voice, wasn't even an animal cry, more like a keening from the earth itself. My skin crawled. Every survival instinct I didn't even know I had screamed to get the hell out of there but my feet stayed where they were, held against my better judgment by a growing morbid fascination. A pale glint of moonlight caught on something by a ridge on the far side of camp. Just beyond the firelight, it moved into full view. 
At first, I couldn't process what I saw, my brain rejecting and scrambling the puzzle pieces. The figure seemed too tall, its shoulders hunched under what looked like a pelt. But when it straightened, it easily stood head and shoulders over my six-foot frame. Pale skin stretched tight over a skeletal build, like an anatomy drawing without the muscle or grace. The limbs were elongated, fingers tipped with filthy claws. I saw its head jerk sideways like a bird, and felt a wave of sickness at the emptiness where a face should have been. Suddenly, it lunged forward in a terrifying parody of human movement. Time shattered. I bolted from my car, fumbling with the keys. It covered the distance between us in a blink. I barely saw it swipe once as I dove inside, a hot spray of blood hitting my cheek. Then the door slamming, then nothing but ragged panting and the pounding of my own heart. Trembling, I locked the doors and scrunched down as low as I could, trying to disappear into the upholstery. Outside, the thing paced. For hours I didn't dare move, a single question circling my brain— could it even get in? Dawn slowly filtered through the dusty windows, a sickly gray light turning the world to ash. Then I saw its monstrous shadow retreating back into the rocks. Relief flooded me, mixed with the icy sting of shock. My shirt was stiff with drying blood, a nasty gash snaked up my forearm. It wasn't deep, but enough to prove this whole nightmare was real. I waited an eternity before mustering the courage to look outside. The desert lay empty under the relentless sun. I started the car and shot out of there, barely remembering to grab my abandoned stuff. Reaching the main road felt like winning a race against death. I reported what I saw to the park rangers, downplaying it as a wild animal attack. Their concern was palpable laced with an unspoken tension. Back in a motel room, I looked myself up online. There were stories there, tales of missing travelers, strange sightings on the edges of the park, threads connecting back decades, and all echoing the hollow horror of my encounter. I saw Photoshop illustrations and blurry campsite surveillance footage. They all pointed to the same conclusion— what I met out there wasn't an animal. Native American tradition told of shape-shifting creatures, vengeful spirits of the natural world they called them skinwalkers. It's been months. There's a faded scar on my arm now, but the internal wounds don't heal so neatly. Sometimes at night, I swear I can hear the whisper of that bone-chilling moan. Some part of me, the foolish part, wants to go back to prove this isn't how my story ends. But another, stronger force is screaming that some lines just shouldn't be crossed again. It all rests on an unnerving thought. If these things have existed at the fringes of our world for so long, just beyond the boundaries of what we deem real, there has to be a reason we haven't wiped them out yet. A decade or so ago, I used to road trip solo a lot. My name's Rowan, and back then, I was fresh out of a messy split, one of those where you barely recognize the person who stares back at you in the mirror. Getting out, getting lost, it became my therapy. That summer, I aimed for the red rock wilderness of southern Utah. It looked primal, rugged everything the sterile confines of city life wasn't. On the drive, I passed one of those tourist traps. They all blend together, rusted Americana signs, shops brimming with alien t-shirts and Navajo dream catchers, and this one had an old gas station. I filled up my tank and struck up a conversation with the shop owner, a leathery woman named Mabel. We had the typical small talk, where to camp, where the crowd's big this time of year. Then she threw something and that stuck with me. 
She had a serious face and lowered her voice conspiratorially. You're gonna be out in the backcountry this time of year. Watch yourself. Things get weird when it's hot. It sounded like a tourist trick, but there was a flicker of genuine concern in her eyes. Then she was all smiles again, wishing me a good trip, the whole thing fading into the background as I continued driving. Days later, I found my perfect spot to pull over. A little side road cutting through sandstone formations led to a clearing, ringed by hoodoos like petrified giants. I parked my trusty old Camry in the scrubby sagebrush and started to settle in. I pitched my tent and took a walk, the silence stretching so deep it felt tangible. That's when I spotted it, something off in the distance moving toward the rock formations. First, I thought it was a trick of the heat bouncing off the sand. Even when I squinted, I couldn't quite focus on it, as if my eyes refused to process what they were seeing. It had been moving erratically, weaving through the rocks with jarring motions. Now, it stood perfectly still. I'll never forget that form, even half a mile away. It appeared to have four long limbs, but moved by scuttling, sometimes dropping onto all fours, then rearing back up in a sickening mimicry of human posture. Where a torso should have been, it seemed to taper away into nothing. Skin shimmered in the late afternoon sun, a mottled mix of sickly gray and patchy hair. My breath caught in my throat because a face should have been there, just a blank expanse of stretched flesh. Panic kicked in, the hot, prickling kind that blots out logic. I spun and sprinted back to my car, throwing every bit of camping gear into the trunk. For whatever reason— the image flashed through my mind of a spider carrying its wriggling prey back to its lair. As I slammed the door and fumbled with the keys, I caught a flash of it again. Now the thing moved with blistering speed, scrambling and leaping in that unsettling way. With a roar of the engine, I shot down the narrow track, bouncing wildly until I merged back onto the paved road. At some point that night— Exhaustion overwhelmed terror. I found a cheap motel with flickering neon signs. In the dingy room, sleep didn't come easy. It wasn't fear of the thing out there. There was something almost rational about that dread. Worse was the nagging question eating away at the corners of my sanity. Had I really seen that at all? Sleep deprivation mixed with heat can wreak havoc on perception. Yet, somewhere deep down I knew, that wasn't something born of hallucination. But if it was real, what was it? I did what we all do now, went straight to the internet. It wasn't hard to find threads on hiker forums and the like, half-told campfire tales of things sighted just off the main trails. Most had been dismissed by armchair experts as wild animal encounters garbled in retelling. Some were more unsettling, like whispers of missing persons whose cases hadn't seemed to garner much attention. There was always an edge of hesitation, though, as if to speak of them too plainly brought a new danger. One website stuck with me. A small blog hosted by an old Navajo woman who shared bits of history and folktales. That's where I found the word for these things— a chill running down my spine as I read the descriptions, skinwalkers. Not exactly monsters, but something warped. Shapeshifters able to mimic a person just enough to draw the unfortunate near. She said they fed on fear. It had circled my camp earlier, not to attack, but to taste terror before driving me off. Something shifted in my mind then, a change from prey to puzzle. Years slipped by in a blur of routine and trying to bury those desert images. It became a story you half-convince yourself never happened. Now and again, on nights where sleep doesn't come easy, those old threads pop into my head. Maybe they wait around those ancient lands, those things on the fringes of what we allow ourselves to believe exists. The thought gnaws at the edges of control, 
an unwelcome reminder that my adventure out there hadn't ended. It was an open story with lines yet to be written. Maybe someday, a stubborn part of me would go back, less driven by curiosity, and more by the desire to face that bone-deep dread instead of letting it simmer on the fringes of my life. It would be reckless, probably stupid, but the alternative seems far worse, letting whatever lives out there claim a bigger slice of this life than it already has. A few summers back, I made a stupid decision. It went something like this, trucks in the shop, got three weeks and an itch for open country. Call me Kellen, restless sort with a habit of taking ill-advised solo hikes. Now I'm the furthest thing from a spiritual guy, but Montana calls to some wild part of you. You see those pictures of Glacier National Park, all peaks and pines and crystal streams. Then, suddenly, that doesn't seem like enough. The problem was, my thirst for something, more got me heading off main trails, deeper into the thick of bear country. This place was old forest, moss hanging heavy off branches, sunlight barely squeezing through, a damp chill lingering even in August. Day two's when I should have bailed. First was the footprints no bear I'd ever seen on park maps left prints like those. For toes, big wide ones, spaced weirdly with claws I could practically picture dragging in the earth. Stubbornness kept me going. Maybe some new species, an undiscovered thing out there. Then, the smell hit. It wasn't animal stink. Rot, yes but also this cloyingly sweet undertone like overripe fruit left festering in the sun. And it wasn't a consistent thing. It drifted on the breeze in and out so my logical brain decided it was just some natural weirdness. Afternoon got stranger. It went from peaceful quiet to dead silent, like nature took a breath with every cricket and bird falling still. Sweat prickled the back of my neck. Suddenly, I realized someone was following me. At first, it was just glimpses, something large, low to the ground, darting behind pines as I turned my head. It made no sound, moved impossibly quick. That's when primal fear outstripped any shred of curiosity. This thing wasn't hunting, it was playing. I picked up the pace, heart rattling in my ribs. Then I heard it a dry, raspy chuckle that echoed through the silent woods. Adrenaline dumped into my veins as I broke into a run. There was a rustle of leaves, something crashing through the brush parallel to me, always out of sight, the sound never falling behind. Then, it let out a high-pitched cry that made my hair stand on end. No beast I knew called like that. There was rough terrain ahead, all gullies and fallen logs. The thought of stumbling was more terrifying than facing whatever stalked me. So I made my stand. I swung around, hands shaking, my pathetic little hiking knife clutched in one fist. It stood on the crest of a rise, silhouetted against the afternoon light. And I knew this was no lost species, nothing natural. There was a wrongness to the way it moved like someone draped a hide over a lanky human frame. No fur, just pale flesh pulled tight across bone. Worst of all, where a head should have been, there was just this, emptiness. For a split second, we both froze. It just tilted its head in a sickening parody of curiosity. Suddenly, it shrieked, an unbearable noise of rage and hunger. I ran. Branches and rocks whipped past, lungs burned, that sound like metal scraping right behind me. Then, my foot caught on a gnarled tree root, and I went sprawling. I scrambled back with pathetic speed, kicking out wildly as it descended. Something sliced my leg, searing pain, but I rolled further back. One moment it crouched there, 
almost savoring the moment, and the next it was gone. Don't ask me how I made it back to the ranger station. The gash kept me patched up in the hospital for a while. There weren't really words for what I saw. They told me a bear was likely behind the tracks, and to consider myself lucky they hadn't found my body. My buddies gave me hell for months, said the high altitude scrambled my brains. And they're probably right, in a way. You gotta be a special kind of dumb to wander that deep unprepared. I haven't gone hiking since. Maybe it's fear, maybe just sanity finally kicking in. I didn't get my big dose of untouched wilderness. But at least I got enough to remind me, there's an awful lot on earth we don't rightly understand. Even those pretty postcard photos can hide stuff that ain't supposed to be photographed at all. I was one of the lucky ones, or so I tell myself. Then, just last week, I found a news story online. Some hikers went missing near those old woods. Not the first bunch, and won't be the last. The article had one detail I'll never forget. They swore they heard weird cackling laughter on the day the hikers vanished. They talked about local legends, old whispered things about those who walk between worlds, skinwalkers, they called them. The chill that went down my back didn't come from a draft. Now, every time a tree branch taps against the window at night, my mind flashes back to that blank, misshapen head, that echoing, inhuman cry. Maybe it didn't get its meal that day, but sometimes I get the sense something isn't quite done with me. It's in those moments I get an even stronger itch to move back to the damned city, where those shadows can't stretch too far. It happened a couple years back, right after college. My name's Declan, always been that restless wanderer type, and a road trip seemed like the best way to shake off the stuffy world of exams and lecture halls. My destination was Yosemite, something about those cliff faces and ancient sequoias just called to me. I drove across Arizona and Nevada, slept under open skies in the desert, that kind of stuff. I took a side road through Sequoia National Forest to avoid traffic. Now, I'm no outdoors expert, but that forest just felt wrong. Too still, the trees so old and thick they blocked out daylight. After hours of winding drive, a gravel road seemed like a perfect place to call it a night. Pulled the car off under this enormous pine. It was dust then, all lawn shadows and damp moss covering everything. As I was making camp, the woods lit up with this weird flashing, like distant strobe lights, but no regular pattern to it. I shrugged it off, probably just lightning way back behind the tree line. That night, sleep kept slipping away. I blamed it on the jet lag, on the hard ground outside the comfort of my sleeping bag. There were noises, though. Heavy thumping on the car roof like hail, but too steady. Then that flashing glow would fill the gaps between the tree branches. Every time I drifted off, my eyes would snap open, like an animal instinct that things weren't right. It started to freak me out. When the first hint of pale light filtered through the canopy, I got the hell out of that place. Hours later, back on the main road, I found a little cafe and went in. The lady at the counter looked as tired as I felt. She didn't ask about my night, just gave me a tired nod and started fixing coffee. A group of folks in hunting gear talked loudly at a table in the back. I overheard one of them mention a park ranger missing overnight near where I'd camped. They described search parties, the whole nine yards. Something struck me funny, so I went to strike up a conversation. As I got closer, though, those guys looked off. There was this dullness in their eyes, a slow kind of way they moved. Didn't feel right. 
They didn't notice as I backed away and slid out of the diner. That whole day driving felt wrong. It wasn't just paranoia. The countryside somehow looked duller, and people in towns and gas stations had that blank stare going on. I reached the outskirts of Yosemite in the evening, found a campground bustling with cheerful families. That put me at ease for a minute. Then, in the bathroom mirror, I got my first good look at myself. There it was, that same flat look in my own eyes. Terror jolted me. I grabbed my bag, keys, hopped in the car, and tore back east. As I got further from the forest, something flickered inside my head. First flashes of that weird light, then that unnatural silence of the woods, and whatever the hell those blank-faced hunters were about. They hadn't attacked, I wasn't harmed, but this felt a whole lot more insidious than being some animal's meal. Back at the roadhouse, they'd already replaced the missing poster with a fresh one not the park ranger, but a hiker from earlier that week. No talk of foul play, just the picture of a guy with the exact same vacant stare I glimpsed that morning. I don't even remember that drive back home. Everything blurs after I escape those pines. It felt like whatever force lurked in that forest wasn't done with me, even if I hadn't gotten lost and killed like those hikers. I started scouring the web, digging into old legends. One page stood out, stories from ancient tribes in the Sierra Nevada, about things that could masquerade. They called them shapeshifters, skinwalkers. It's been years, that dead look faded from my eyes, but something lingers. Like part of me is still out there in that darkness, forever trapped amongst the redwoods. Even with a city's worth of light around me, a shadow seems to cling to the edge of my vision, like something waiting in the wings to retake its stolen skin. The pull of those mountains haunts my dreams, part thrill, part absolute, primal terror. Every year, they get a little stronger. Now, when those flashing lights start in the back of my mind, they come a bit sooner each time. I don't know how many stolen sunsets I have left before that pull to the forest, to the heart of that ancient, hungry thing, drags me back. And this time, maybe I won't make it out of those woods alive. A few years back, I took one of those ancestry DNA tests. You know, the kind that sends you pie charts and promises long-lost cousins? That's how I found out about the cabin. Deep in the Ozark Mountains, on some acreage my great-great-something owned way before Missouri was even a state. Seemed strange, as everyone on my mom's side landed in Ellis Island in the 1920s, but hey free trip to the woods? Why not? My name is Cal, by the way. Short for Caliban, but don't get any ideas. My folks weren't English professors, just fans of old sci-fi flicks. Life as Caliban hasn't exactly been easy, so a week alone in a rustic cabin seemed like therapy the insurance companies wouldn't cover. The old place took two buses and a five-mile hike to reach, not a soul around, and the forest felt so thick you could practically chew the air. It was exactly what I needed, or thought I did. Second night in, though, I start hearing noises. Rumbling noises, big enough they sent tremors through the old floorboards. Earthquake? I thought, but hey, this is Missouri, not LA Night 3, the noise is back. Now I'm sure something's out there. Bigfoot? Some escaped lunatic? My mind races through every scary backwoods movie I've ever half-watched on cable. Finally, curiosity and my trusty hunting rifle went out over common sense. There's nothing around to give off light besides the moon, casting long, distorted shadows of the trees. Even the crickets shut up when that rumbling sound rolls through the clearing again. This time I make out a shape, 
dark against the darkness, hulking on two legs, taller than an elk. But those were four points I saw against the sky when it reared up, not antlers. Something snaps inside me, more adrenaline than fear. Maybe a little too much of the cheap bourbon I brought to make the solitude bearable. I lever a shell in and fire a shot. Roars louder than the gunshot echo back, and with a flash of movement that shouldn't have been possible, that shape streaks toward the cabin. I barely get the door slammed in time. Something heavy slams against it, once, twice. Wood cracks but holds. That, whatever it is, scrabbles over the roof, making the shingles clatter. This wouldn't look out of place in a zombie movie, some twisted thing desperate to get at the tasty brains inside. Then silence, except for the pounding of my own blood in my ears. Dawn doesn't come fast enough. Finally, with enough light, I edge past the ruined door and out. The yard is torn up, like a giant bulldozer with claws went wild. There's stuff here, too. Blood spatter, bright crimson against the moss and bits of cloth snagged on broken branches. No idea if they're mine or part of whatever that monstrous beast was. My hands shake too hard to follow any real trail, even if I'd wanted to. Now, you'd think that's when I'd hike my tail out of there and forget about lost ancestors. But part of me just needed to know. And hey, I still had five days before the bus came back. What's the old saying, better the devil you know? Besides, I always hated leaving unfinished business. Just ask my ex. I spent that day fortifying the cabin, barricades on the windows, dragging heavy furniture against weak spots. There were more supplies here than a weekend vacation should call for. Old axes, bundles of twine, an oil lamp. Seemed my ancestors got nervous and stocked up after something rattled them a while back. Night comes again. Maybe that was the point I should have given in. But you know how it is, right? It's the anticipation that really gnaws at your guts. So I set up camp on the roof, rifle across my lap, eyes straining into the night. Maybe this was one bad breakup my usual wisecracks couldn't fix. The rumbling comes again, softer at first, like approaching thunder. And then it steps into the moonlight. It was gaunt, skin so tight I could see ribs through the patchy fur. Arms too long, fingers ending in hooked claws. And that face, like a wolf, if a mad scientist built it for war instead of hunting deer. Yellow eyes gleamed as it raised its head, sniffing the air like it caught my scent on the breeze. And that was when I saw its back, scarred, humped in a way that looked all wrong. This thing walked upright, but there was no denying a horrible twist in its spine. We both froze for a second, and then it went berserk. Leaping across the yard in a single bound, tearing up dirt. Something shrieked deep inside it, not an animal but a mangled version of a human voice. I took aim, fired. That only seemed to piss it off more. It charged, scaled the side of the cabin with those claws, a grotesque parody of a mountain climber. Somehow, the old roof held. Barely. Through the night we circled, me firing rounds to keep it at bay while its howls shook the whole darn forest. By morning, my ammo was gone, and we were both ragged with exhaustion. It slunk off behind the trees, glaring with those horrible eyes. Maybe it thought I was done for. Maybe that was the game with this creature. To wear you down until you stopped fighting back. I stumbled inside, collapsed, and slept deeper than I had in years. I came to the sound of voices, gruff, shouting with fear, but unmistakably human. Through the boarded-up window I saw three guys staring up at the roof, guns leveled. Turns out my nightly fireworks show drew curious locals. 
They filled me in after they saw the state of the place there had been tales of the beast haunting those woods for ages. Attacks on livestock, campers vanishing, I just got unlucky enough to have that thing stalk me right home. I'm out of that nightmare now. Back to city crowds and sirens, which sound pretty peaceful after something like that. Never looked too deep into what kind of monster I battled there. The guys called it a skinwalker, Native American lore, I think. Evil spirit walking around wearing an animal hide. Whatever name you put on it, I hope to hell it stays the heck away from whatever address is on my driver's license from now on. This all happened back when cell service plans went by minutes, not data limits. My work took me all over the place, sales calls, scoping the competition, that kind of thing. So yeah, driving solo through the boondocks was a part of life as Jake Murphy, always on the move. But you'd call me an optimist, kind of guy sees the upside. Fewer cars on the road means I make those appointments early, right? Well, this one afternoon, I swear even the birds quit singing to watch me go by. I'm taking a back road way up in Maine. Folks love those. Authentic, small-town suppliers here. I've barely passed another vehicle since noon, just this thick green forest pressing right up against the asphalt. Then I round a bend, and there's a guy dead ahead, in the middle of the road. I slam on the brakes. There's something wrong, immediately. I can't quite say what. But the instinct screaming turn around starts loud enough to drown out good sense. Well, you know the type, right? Always charging in to save the day where plain caution would do. That's me. The guy doesn't move when I approach. Turns out it isn't good Samaritan time after all. This poor fella, there's no nice way to put it. Shredded is one word that comes to mind. Clothes a bloody mess, too many gashes to count, some deep enough to reveal bone. No sign of a car wreck, no blood splatter beyond the ten-foot area around him. He's lying on his back, staring wide-eyed at the clear blue sky above us. I check for a pulse, nothing. Phone finds no signal out here, of course. Suddenly, I feel that prickly sensation on the back of my neck. Something is here, watching. The forest. It's thick with shadow, like all those trees have leaned closer for a better look. A branch snaps behind me. Something moves, big and fast, but a glimpse through the underbrush leaves me questioning my own eyes. Whatever it was, it made me bolt. Back to the car, fumbling for the keys like a teenager on prom night. As soon as I hit the gas, a blur rushes across the road ahead, blocking my way. And I get my first good look at this thing. I wish I hadn't. There's fur matted, stained dark with what I hope to God ain't what it looks like. An animal build, kind of, except hunched over, arms longer than they should be. Then those eyes fix on me, yellow, full of some wicked intelligence. I swear at it. No idea if it understands, but the thing raises up on its hind legs, letting loose a shriek that could crack bones. Now, my sales tactics never did include running folks down. That's how I wind up whipping the car in reverse, ditching the road right as this. Freak crashes into the driver's side. Glass bursts. A cloth slices the leather seat open like paper. But I hit the gas, bumping straight over roots and rocks, desperate for some open space. My side mirror explodes as the creature pursues, bounding alongside. Its legs work wrong, jerky, but my old beat-up sedan isn't outrunning this. Ahead, through the trees, is a break, something more than just a forest path. I go full tilt toward it, swerving into an abandoned lot dust kicking up behind me. 
There's old rusty farm equipment scattered around, and an open barn. Without thinking, hey, panic does that to you, I floor it straight inside. My pursuer doesn't even break stride. It slams into the barn doors, tearing them from hinges. Darkness falls across me, just for a second, as the whole building shudders under the impact. Wood scrapes against metal as I weave around old machinery. Light slices through as the roof is ripped away chunk by chunk. Desperation fuels one crazy idea. There's an old baler with its arms still up. I jerk the wheel, praying this jalopy holds together long enough. Claws tear into the rear paneling, sending up chunks of plastic and foam just as I duck beneath the raised steel of the baler. It crashes into the monster square on, maybe knocking it down, but its scream fills the air as I shoot out the far side of the barn and back into sunlight. My rear window now offers a clear view of it scrambling away, back into the trees. It takes an hour for the sheriff and his deputies to show up, no surprise, this being deep country. When I point them toward the ravaged barn, they give me the old. Bears get hungry this time of year. Speech. There was blood smeared all over that farm equipment, enough that any normal person would back up my wild story. I left Maine the next day, never even made that business meeting. Back on the road, every passing forest felt a little darker, every bend hid unseen possibilities. Sometimes late at night, when I'm all alone in a budget motel room, I imagine those yellow eyes gleaming from the shadows, or hear that monstrous howl splitting the air. You could put a name on it. Say I got spooked. Or tell me there's some twisted folks out there in those deep woods. But some folks here swear that old tale's true, an evil thing living on an animal hide, walking out of Native American myth and into the back roads of America. Some folks call it a skinwalker. Whatever it was, I hope like hell I never cross paths with it again. It all started when I moved to Flagstaff, Arizona. Always wanted to get out of the city and do that roughing it thing, figure out if I had the stuff those old western legends were made of. Yeah, you can laugh. My name's Grant, by the way. Or what's left of me is still named Grant. Got this tiny shack out on the edge of the Cocomino National Forest, rented cheap through a local guy. Guess nobody really cared about how water lines froze solid after the first couple of snows. It's the kind of place you only stay in if you can tough it out or you're desperate. I figured I was a little of both. One morning, early after that big storm, I wake up and something isn't right. Like someone was watching. That old fight-or-flight instinct kicks in, and my first thought, honestly, was that the landlord had found me, ready to kick my backside out come spring. Step outside into the snow. Everything quiet save for the crunch under my boots. Then I see it, tracks in the snow, circling my place. They were big, bigger than human. For wide toes, maybe claw marks at the end. Not a dog, not a bear, this ain't wildlife I recognize. Panic takes over. Not exactly a nature expert here. Maybe a mountain lion casing me out? I grab my grandpa's old hunting rifle, just in case. Next few days, it only gets worse. I call animal control. Guy who picks up clearly thinks I'm one sandwich short of a picnic, but tells me to keep an eye out, set some cameras if I'm serious. Only trouble is, my place is so old I practically had to crank start the TV. There's something else too, an awful smell hanging in the air like a weak old carcass. No animal tracks since that first sighting, though. Then comes that next full moon. Sleep won't come. 
can't shake the feeling I'm trapped here. Then, something scratching at the back door, wood splintering against raw power. That smell is so strong it burns my throat. Whatever's out there howls along, wailing cry that goes on and on until I swear my eardrums will burst. Something crashes into the porch. Glass shatters somewhere. It breaks through into the living room. Panic kicks in full blast. I fire in the direction of that monstrous cry. The old rifle nearly jumps out of my hands. It roars back, something heavy crashing right below the bedroom window. Something slams against the wall below. Boards groan and break in a splintering crash. It's on the roof now, scratching hard enough to tear up the old shingles. And it's wailing again, that ear-splitting sound right above me. There's another crash as part of the ceiling gives way, bits of plaster raining down on me. Then I see it. It crouches in the hole. Its skin sags, sickly gray and hairless. Ribs peek out from its emaciated torso. Eyes glow like amber and burn into mine. My finger rests on the trigger, but fear freezes me solid. Then it smiles, stretching lips back away from needle-sharp teeth. Just before it leaps for me, I fire again. And again. I hear something heavy thump to the floor below, then a choked gurgle. Finally, silence. I run like I've never run before. Stumble and fall, half-dragging myself in the snow. There's blood, and scraps of, something, trailing up over the roof into the woods. Can't go back there. Keep telling myself, just find help, make it to the ranger station. Hours later, collapse somewhere out on the trailhead, finally picked up by an early morning hiker. Nobody believed me. Talked about shock, trauma, even questioned if I'd gotten into a stash of bad drugs somewhere out in that shack. No sign of blood in the snow, though they took samples for testing. My landlord never turned up again. I couldn't bear to go back. Lost everything when they cleaned out the place after those tests came back clean. But there was another piece. Weeks later, they dug up a body outside that same shack. Never could quite make out an ID, too ravaged. That, they thought, was a bare encounter from weeks earlier, something a desperate animal did just trying to survive the storm. And those old Native American stories from nearby reservations they started making more sense. The ones about things hidden in plain sight, creatures that wear other skins and can never be caught or pinned down. People call them shapeshifters, some sort of ancient evil spirit made flesh. Some folks tell it they only hunt those filled with desperation. Folks like me, moving too far outside the world without respecting what else might live between the shadows and the trees. They call them skinwalkers. And those eyes burn into my dreams still. That sickly smile right before it jumped. Those weren't the eyes of an animal. I may have escaped, but it still has a piece of me out there in those old Arizona woods. Some days I feel it tugging at my soul. It happened out near the Olympic Peninsula years ago now. I was working odd jobs at the time, trying to pay for tuition by doing all those go pick this up and take it somewhere gigs that pop up online. Figured this one would be an easy paycheck. Some lady up near Forks needed this weird old antique doll collection moved. Call me Wyatt, by the way. You might as well get the name of the dead guy, right? This place where I was hauling those dolls, there wasn't even a good road once you got into that thick rainforest. Fog draped over everything, giving it a creepy vibe. Old moss hung from the trees like those gray beards you see in history books. No wonder these twilight movies got filmed nearby. Felt like something monstrous could step out, and you wouldn't see it until it was too late. 
Cell service had given up the ghost miles earlier. Made a joke about a vampire hiding the box I was hauling just to screw with me while I still had enough signal to send it. The lady who'd hired me wouldn't come right out and say why she couldn't make the pickup herself, not on the phone anyway. Figured something must be wrong with her car, or she was old and didn't drive no more. The house, I dunno. Not quite run down, but something didn't feel right. Like nobody lived there for real. An older model truck was rusting away parked out front, no fresh tire tracks going up the dirt path that passed for a driveway. I knock, then wait, then pound even harder. No answer. Getting ready to just dump the box and count it as a delivery attempt, and that's when I hear the scratching noises inside. I call out my name, announce the package with a weak joke about antique dolls being less evil than clowns, nothing but muffled sounds as a reply. Finally, with that gnawing gut feeling you always ignore in horror flicks, I try the knob. Door isn't locked. Place stinks of rot mixed with some chemical tang. Lights dim, everything covered in dusty old sheets. Then the scratching becomes louder, like from the living room up ahead. And there's an undercurrent of moaning mixed in, just barely audible. My hand's steady enough to flip on my phone flashlight. Thank God for useful apps back in the day, right? The thing I caught at the edge of the light beam made me flinch back like I'd been slapped. I don't have words for what I saw. Not then, not really even now. It was big and hunched down low, but moved more like a spider than a man should. Skin a patchwork of gray and scabs, hair long and matted. Something glints where its eyes should be. Then its head jerks toward me, mouth working open and close, like it's tasting my scent in the air. And that's when I saw it had something long in its hands, red slit across it, with scraps of, no way would I think that's what they actually were. Now, a smart man runs right then. Hell, the smart man gets out of there the first time his skin prickled out that far into the damn trees. Me, I bolt but stumble over some kind of old chest the second that creature makes an inhuman hissing sound. It knocks right into me. Hard enough to send me slamming into the wall, but not hard enough to stop it. My hand scrabbles against the floor, and something hard, old wooden handle brushes against my fingers. With that unholy beast charging again, I just grab and swing. Must have been an axe or hatchet under those dust sheets, seriously. Who keeps this crap laying around, right? It connects with a meaty thwack and something shrieks loud enough to crack glass in the next room. That creature is up again way too fast, but not as fast as me on pure adrenaline. It tears right through the front door like paper, splinters spraying my face. I throw everything in the truck and haul us the wrong way down that path. No time for turning around, branches slapping against the sides, that screeching pursuing me at least until I hit pavement. Took an hour before I realized the box holding the dolls had busted open in the back. One look inside sent me straight to the nearest gas station to throw up. Those weren't antique dolls, not like any doll I ever saw. Skinned animal parts, maybe? Whatever they were made of, the smell alone stuck with me for nights. Called cops right after. Gave them every scrap of info I had, but they never turned up a lead. Place was abandoned, no real trace left behind. Nobody matching the description around those parts either. They had some missing person reports out in the area, though. Never solved. Sometimes I do the math on missing folks around there, figure the odds I was the first or the last that creature tangled with. That keeps me up at night more than that thing's face burned into my brain. One of those local boys, the kind who spent whole summers wandering the woods, told me once that there are old stories they hear. 
Things in those trees that ain't supposed to walk around in the open light of day. Twisted ones in man shape, hungry for what we wouldn't want to live without. Some folks call them skinwalkers. After what I saw, I can't say I disbelieve them.